I think I've been guilty of this. So, like, anyone who's been listening to Corporate Warrior from the beginning, I'll always ask the question, right? In every single podcast I've done, practically, I'll ask you how, what is the optimal approach to, to gaining muscle mass? Welcome to Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years experience training clients and has supervised over 15,000 high-intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high-intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW and the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hey guys, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior. This podcast is designed to explore how to improve productivity in health, career, business and lifestyle by interviewing the most effective people that I can find today. So my guests include zero carb world record holders like Sean Baker, medical physicians like Ted Naiman, health and fitness giants like Ben Greenfield, high intensity training specialists like Dr. Doug McGuff, sports scientists, highly successful business owners, startup founders, extreme endurance adventure races and many many more today's guest is me and in this episode i am being interviewed by my best friend Stuart ralph who you probably you may know that name before since Stuart has been a guest on this podcast he is the founder of the ocd stories blog and podcast and you can find out all about him and his work at the ocd so that's the ocd stories.com The purpose of this episode was to answer your most popular questions, tell you a little bit more about my story and talk to you about the most important things I have learned from my guests on the show. So in a little bit more detail, what do we cover? We cover my story, how Corporate Warrior came to be, how we came up with the name and why the domain name is really long and inappropriate, etc. We talk about the five biggest takeaways that I have learned recording 60 plus episodes my latest thoughts on optimizing muscle gain and fat loss, a detailed view of my current workout and diet. We talk about steroid use, the male obsession of optimizing muscle gain, genetics, and then we finish on the subject of productivity, which is something I'm very passionate and nerdy about. So I talk to you about my routines, how I'm using checklists, my favorite applications, and sort of timeless productivity principles that I have used um, with, I guess, some success um, through my career in business, uh, in sales, but also uh, in growing Corporate Warrior. And also, Stuart asks me some very personal questions, include why I run around my university campus completely naked. So if you're interested, perhaps not so much in that, but in just getting a more uh, in-depth view on me as a person, uh, it sounds very egotistical for me to say that, um, then you will enjoy this. But obviously, I do cover a lot of stuff in relation to the typical podcast topics, which I think you'll find very useful. So for all the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.co. 
And at the end, don't forget to hang around for your free gift. Now, please do be patient with this one as I am a little nervous at the start. I don't know why, but the first sort of five minutes, I'm pretty nervous. But after a while, I completely chill out and all is well. So without further ado, welcome to episode 67 with yours truly. So uh, welcome back, guys, to another episode of Corporate Warrior. I'm with um, Stuart Ralph today. Stuart is a very close friend of mine who's going to be, we're going to change the format somewhat today, and he's going to be interviewing me and asking me some of your most popular questions um, and just running through a few things that I guess I get asked by you guys quite a lot on email and over social media. So I'll hand over to Stuart and uh, he'll sort of start doing the interview. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, yeah. Hey, everyone. As Laura says, I'm Lane Stewart. Um, I, I'm happy to be here interviewing Laws for the Corp Nation, for all you guys out there. And uh, it might be my interview style might be different to Laws's, but hopefully you'll, uh, you'll appreciate it all the same. Uh, I have a few of my own questions as well that I've added in. And the first one, so on my podcast, I always find out, you know, the person I'm interviewing, what's their story? Uh, usually it's a mental health story in this case, uh, feel free to share that if you want, Loz, but, um, it's more just to get your story and I'll let you interpret that however you want. Okay. Cool. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's cool. I'll, uh, I will give my summary of my story. So, um, I guess from a kind of career and health and fitness viewpoint, I'll give it from that kind of, in that kind of context. So, um, Grew up and was born in Portsmouth in the UK and grew up there. Um, studied very close by at the University of Chichester, which um, obviously is where we became friends and played basketball together and that kind of thing and lived yeah. together. Um, I then uh, was was very coming out of university. I was very I was a changed person in that I was much more motivated and much more uh, I had much more ambition about me. So I wanted to achieve my my potential. And at that that point, it was really focused on um, trying to s- secure some sort of business success um, and you know whatever means necessary so i was sort of interviewing for jobs in uh portsmouth to begin with uh, eventually got a job there doing tele sales which i fell into completely by accident um because i thought it was some sort of marketing job and i was after marketing roles at the time and then uh, eventually i got a job in london and uh, not in london sorry actually i got a i went to a, a recruitment agency called Pareto Law, who are quite well known in this country, um, who specialise in placing graduates into sales jobs. And that was my sort of, I guess, my my path into, you know, better sales roles. And then kind of things kind of progressed from there. And I, I moved through different sales jobs and I kind of moved up the salary ladder and um secured more opportunity as I as I went uh, eventually moving to London developing my career there um, but after a while in the kind of IT sales space I, I guess got a little bit bored um, working for corporations didn't like the way they were always run didn't like the fact that I had to um, do certain things and follow certain processes that I felt were really inefficient and pointless um, and I think during this time, I kind of come across Tim Ferriss's Four Hour Work Week, which opened my mind up to other options and the the opportunities that are out there to create businesses um, or create, yeah, I guess other businesses or other income streams, doing things you really enjoy and freeing up your time to. I guess, just focus on what you're passionate about. And that really inspired me. And for a long time, obviously, you came to London, we lived together, and we were both very driven by this kind of possibility and opportunity that we could create our own thing, be it a blog or some sort of online business that we could then um, use to supplant our full-time income. Uh, and that was a that was a big thing for me. And um so I'm going to more talk about the business side of things because I think that's I, I keep it all kind of about the same sort of thing at the moment. Um, and then, as you know, recently I uh, decided to quit that um, corporate job I had in London, and at the same time moved to Galway in Ireland to live with my partner. Um, and in doing so, decided to focus on corporate warrior full time um, and 
yeah, fortunately, I've been lucky enough to save some money to help that to help that journey along. Um, but obviously, now it's about really trying to crank up the content engine for corporate warrior make sure i'm pushing out great content and also figure out how i can i guess monetize that going forward to to support me and make sure i can keep this going so that's from a business point of view that's a very like i guess high level summary of um how that journey's progressed um and all along i should also say that because i want to kind of talk about health and fitness stuff because obviously I'll tell the story about how kind of corporate warrior came about, which I have talked about on the socials before and a bit on the blog, but I think it might be interesting to people listening to this. So um, we were living together and we were kind of always brainstorming new businesses and ideas and things like that. And you came into my room one day and you were like, you had the idea. You said, let's, because I, I'd, I'd, read body by science i had learned about high intensity training listening to like videos by dr Doug mcguff and stuff like that and um i was talking to you about it for weeks saying oh you know uh, this 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 exercise is awesome like i've reduced my uh exercise volume right down i'm getting great results and you were just going mad because i was just talking to you about it all the time proper dogmatic yeah i was like Jeff Ava's witness at my door I was very dogmatic and uh, I think I think I'm much better these days and far more open-minded but yeah there was a time when I was very dogmatic um, and then you came into my room one day and you were like let's 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 turn this into a business let's you know you do all the content and I'll do all the marketing as in you do all the, the marketing and the website and stuff like that and I was like yeah let's go for it so we did it together um, and that's how we started off with the whole 15 minute corporate warrior.com domain which people say to me is far too long but we we specifically chose that domain because we were selling a, uh, I think, ebook course or something. Yeah. That was that was that was called that. So that's why we had that domain. Um, and we we got so far. We we produced a sales video and we tried to do that, but it didn't really work out. To be fair, we probably didn't go as far with it as we could have. And at the same time, you were juggling so many different websites and other businesses that you were like, you know what, Lawrence, I can't I can't commit to this and keep doing this. And so we decided at that point that you we would split, I would focus on it solely and you would move on to your other stuff. Um yeah. and then I decided that, and then it just deviated course when I I guess uh gained ownership of it. And I just I just decided that to blog for some reason as opposed to pushing products um, and try and just try and kind of hone in on like, you know, creating content that I was passionate about. Uh, and at the time it was a lot of written content. And then one day I think I just, I can't even remember how I had the idea, but I thought I'd love to ask uh, Dr. Doug McGuff a load of questions that had, uh, that had been prompted after reading Body by Science. Um, and I reached out to him, did an interview and he was very, you know, kind and you know as high profile as he was perhaps as not as he is as much as he is now um but he still was very very uh, kind to give me that time um and then yeah and then he came on to my what the time was a you know podcast i suppose but it wasn't really you know, i had no other guests or anything like that um and then that just kind of took off from there. I had really good feedback. I learned a lot. I really enjoyed it. I kept it going. And as I released a new episode, um, and then I, I guess my audience grew because that guest would then share that with their audience. Uh, I got more and more positive feedback. And then that started kind of the ball rolling. And and then the podcast started, uh, I guess I started getting more and more guests with different backgrounds. Um and that's how this all started. It was the first time I'd started getting really good feedback from stuff I was putting out on the internet. Because before that, I wasn't getting the feedback. I wasn't getting the, you know, that kind of positive feedback, which makes you want to keep doing it and motivates mm -hmm. you because you realize you're you're actually helping people. And that's what this is all about. Um, so that's kind of how it all started. And, you know. 62 episodes later here we are so nice yeah well good job and uh, i know it's bloody hard doing a weekly episode and uh, and being committed is, is tough so it's a good achievement um <clears throat> i think it's something there's a couple of things i want to point out one is on you talking about uh, you know doug mcguff and him giving you the time and and rightly so it was a kind thing of him to do um but i think people people think oh it's it's really 
you know, I'm never going to be able to get that person on my podcast, on my blog, uh, or for whatever reason you need them. But if you go to these people and you're sincere and you're genuine and, and you have a good heart and you want to achieve something pure and noble, in your case, you were just very passionate and interested in sort of sports exercise and nutrition and whatever else. And it's the same for me on my fourth episode I got Dr. Stephen Hayes who's who's unbelievably well known in the in the world of psychology and arguably has achieved uh I think he was rated in the top thirty or something like all time psychologists or something. And anyway I contacted him and he came on at the end of the show he said, you know, after two hours of talking to me, he said uh, you know, I came on your show because I see you're doing something good and I know what you're doing and I wanted to help you. And I think that's that's something I wanted to highlight. Just generally in life, people need to like have a bit more belief and just go for it. And these good people want to help. They're not all douchebags. Um, so the other thing I want to uh, link back into your story is when we were at uni, you're, you, you, are the, you were the person then that you are now. <laughs> but from a fitness point of view, you were far from the person you are now, like, you played basketball with me and stuff. You occasionally went to the gym, but it obviously it was far from what you do now. Uh, you uh, you weren't overweight. Well, you well you weren't fat in the sense of what people would consider fat, but for your body type, you you were. You know, you ate these microwavable pizzas. I mean, we both we yeah we both ate shit during uni because we didn't know better. Um, but I, I don't know, I just wanted to highlight that point of you in no way interested in exercise for exercise sake or for health or longevity or energy as you are now. And I don't know, that a, impresses me how people can change over time. Uh, but also, I don't know, maybe to give others hope who aren't where they are right now in their health and fitness, the belief that it can change dramatically. But um, purely from good information you know you you felt anthony bova's spartan 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 health regime yeah spartan health regime and that blew your mind i read that and i was like wow this is amazing and then it led you on eventually to body by science and i think that's it it's just being curious and if you're curious you will achieve anything you want um maybe long-winded and ramble but i wanted to highlight that yeah okay so next question is from stuart gilbert yeah so great name stuart um <laughs> <laughs> of all the people you've interviewed name five that have given you one piece of advice that you have implemented into your training he, he also goes on to say who are the top five people and what advice they give you so it's very similar yeah so I'll, I'll, I'll um i'll name the person so i did think about this one um and i think the first one that come to mind was um not to be surprised um it was dr doug mcguff and he said to me, I think it was on the last episode we spoke together, he said, I think it was his, his kind of last piece of advice was to become superhuman, you must realize that you're only human. And I really like that because, you know, there's this big, there's this kind of dogma in health and fitness and, and in like work as well, where people think more is better, that they just think, you know, that if I exercise more and exercise hard all the time and I don't sleep and, you know, the same with working, like if I work all the time that I'm going to be superhuman but really you have to realize that you know you're an organism with limited resources and you have to you have to think about that when you're training so in health and fitness context you know you need to make sure that you are giving yourself breaks that you're not working out intensely all the time that you're getting plenty of sleep and i think it's easy to forget that stuff and especially if you're trying to uh trying to get the best results in terms of like muscle gain i do think you need to really pay attention to that um so that was a big one for me uh, another one was uh john little who i had on the podcast and he that's good yeah i i'm well fortunately he's coming back on which i'm really excited about and uh, it's been <laughs> it's been challenging because he's been very busy um but he said something to me which really really hit home which was to encourage me and others not to parrot other people um, and never to take anything on faith. And he said, test out, test it and find out if true, but always retain a healthy skepticism and don't rob yourself the opportunity to learn something. And I think we do that all the time. We just kind of take information. I do it still sometimes take information as faith and then start like, you know, 
parroting it to everyone you talk to and then it becomes like your thing and you know i just think i just think that's not the way to go it's you need to really test stuff out for yourself um and yeah take it as an opportunity to learn another one was a uh, simon shawcross who um was also been on the podcast and he taught me uh not to look at each workout in isolation but take a longer term view so understanding that you know let's say I do one exercise and I get a shorter time under load than the previous workout to see that as maybe as not as a drop in performance, but actually as uh, actually myself getting better at performing that particular exercise. So actually I'm getting more efficient and effective at fatiguing musculature, which didn't even, I hadn't even thought about it like that until he kind of suggested it. Uh, another one was Bill De Simone, who's um, popular for talking about a joint congruent exercise and biomechanics. And he's really helped me um, in terms of helping me avoid or minimize exercises that can cause injuries. So I do try and mitigate or sorry, minimize or I guess... Um, I try, yeah, I try not to perform exercises that are going to, they're going to have a high risk of injury. Um, and I think that's really served me well to learn that at a young age so that I can make sure I'm exercising for the long term. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say is as a collective, um, I really, and I guess this is important because. I know people are interested in, and I know Stuart's interested in understanding, like, you know, I've interviewed all these people, like, what have I taken from it? And I think one of the, one of the big things I've taken from it is that it's quite ironic. I've, it started off as a high intensity training podcast. And, you know, when I started it, I was very dogmatic about high intensity training. And I was like, you know, very kind of like Arthur Jones, like, this is how it is. You need this much time to recover. You must do this. You must execute on these things. Um, but more recently, I guess in the last six months, I've become a lot less married to the high intensity training principles and learned that any resistance training protocol, you know, will work and will probably get you, you know, 90% of your results. I just think a lot of this uh, debate and argument over protocol and changing the real kind of you know, the stuff on the margins and the real kind of tiny variables really doesn't matter that much. That's kind of my belief uh, at this time. Um, and as a result, I'm just, you know, far more open-minded about, I guess, exercise and resistance training in general. So those are my the takeaways. I mean, there's been tons more takeaways than that, but those are like the ones that came to mind straight away when I saw that question. Yeah, no, good answers. Um Okay, so what is your current exercise regime? Ah, so I'm actually writing a blog post about this right now, but I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a spoiler. Give the here. shortened version. Then. So I'm doing, I'm doing kind of. I'm not going to probably remember like every exercise, but I'm doing a, um, an A B split. So that means I'm altern I'm alternating between the A and B workout every every two days um but i'm only working out three times a week if that makes sense so like monday wednesday friday for example so uh, higher frequency than i have in the past and that's because i'm kind of playing around with um yeah just just increasing frequency uh following some of the latest literature that's come out and um, that james Steele and i discussed on the latest podcast um but they are they are kind of condensed uh, abbreviated workouts so they're not like you know, 10 exercises. Um, I've taken the, I've kind of modified the workouts in Project Kratos, which is one of the books that Drew Bay um, produced. And that's all about body weight, high intensity training workouts. Um, so I'll actually bring up, I'll bring up, I've got um, the file here so I can actually bring it up and talk about, just give me a sec. So yeah, so for instance, uh, the B workout, which I did, yesterday um i actually did time static contraction uh for neck uh so that's time static contraction neck extension and neck flexion and that's basically where i, I roll up a, a travel mat and um, which is one of the mats we use when we go camping rough um and then i i lay it on the floor and i push my I, I lay on it so i lay on the floor of my back and i have the the roll under my the back of my skull 
And the way a TSC protocol works is you you push 50% intensity for 50 seconds, uh, sorry, 30 seconds, 75% intensity for uh, 30 seconds, and then as hard as you dare, 100% intensity for the last 30 seconds. Um, and it's pretty tiring. And then I do the same for neck flexion, which is where you face down on the floor and you push your forehead against the mat and do exactly the same protocol. So the only reason I did that at home because I'm trying to explain the situation at the moment, is because I feel like an idiot doing that in the gym and I'm kind of embarrassed, yeah. which uh, is a, a bit embarrassed to even admit that because, like, who cares? But that's what yeah. I did. <laughs> Those who mind don't matter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, then I went off to the gym and I did single-legged squats. Oh, so that's right and left leg. Uh, Chin-ups, dips, row machine, pike push-up and plank. And these are all single set to failure absolutely exhausting uh, i tried to really you know um alas or ted Naiman triple failure so that means hit failure positive failure then uh, isometric failure where you can't move the you can't move anymore or move the weight of resistance and then negative failure which is just making sure the negative or eccentric part of the movement is very is as slow as possible um and then i got an a workout a routine which is chin up push up single legged squat prone trunk extension to focus on the lower back and then again the time ta- time static contraction neck uh, flexion and extension um and then i play basketball on a sunday evening and i try and do a long walk once a day and that's basically my exercise regimen at the moment yeah no, that's good and do you think it's working for you <laughs> um i do it's interesting i well I, it's too early to say uh, whether or not i will pre- respond well to that frequency um i've noted that since i've i mean we can go on to diet are we going on to diet later because i've noticed uh, changes question, from diet, yeah. but okay so I just, shall i just go into that then yeah yeah <laughs> so so uh since i've since i moved to um to ireland i've been so you know my life's been quite upside down and i've not really had yeah. any kind of stability so i've just been trying out gyms wherever i am so when first when we uh, moved to ireland with my partner you know we were living with her mum in tralee and kerry and you know i found a gym and i was kind of just going in and just just going in with a view that okay as long as i do you know, a workout where I'm doing one horizontal pushing and pulling movement, one vertical pushing and pulling movement, and some kind of leg press or squat, uh, and maybe a lower back exercise, which is kind of the template I try and follow when I'm just trying to get a workout in. Um, I know I'm going to be, you know, uh, stimulating my body to make sure that I'm, you know, retaining a good good level of health and building muscle and all that. So I'm getting I'm getting all the results I can, type of thing. Um, So I was just going in with that kind of objective, like just do that, just go to failure. No real kind of like not measuring progress, wasn't measuring resistance, nothing like that. Wasn't measuring time under load. And then when I moved to Galway, it was the same kind of deal because I was just trying to find the gym that I wanted to join. So I was trying out all the gyms in Galway and eventually I found one that was cheap as chips. It's this kid on on my fence in the garden. He's trying to balance it and he's just like almost fell off. Anyway, ignore that. So (laughs) I'll leave that in. Um, So, so yeah. That's Ireland for you, mate. Ah, exactly. So eventually, (laughs) eventually found a gym called Planet Health. Um, and it's awesome. And it's, uh, it's 20 euros, uh, 27 euros a month, which is like, what? uh probably 30 dollars something like that it's very 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 little um yeah. and uh and then now that i've found that gym and i've kind of committed to a to a monthly contract i'm now uh since then i've started like experimenting with this kind of ab routine that i just described um but anyway so what i have been doing though since moving to ireland is having just two meals a day um, partly because it was just convenient um, and was sort of further inspired by Art Devaney's um, latest work where he, he talks about how he has two meals a day spaced quite far apart for, um, I guess, health and longevity purposes. Um, and so basically I've been having like, you know, just kind of eating based on my intuition. So when I'm hungry, I eat <laughs> and uh, and I eat and I eat big meals and then I just fast until I'm hungry again and then eat again. It's generally two meals a day. Um, and it's, it's it, you know, fasting just happens organically because I'm just eating when I'm hungry as opposed to like snacking. 
Um, yeah. And in terms of the meals and what they look like, it's pretty much huge portions of animal protein. So maybe a steak or two. Um, and I generally like have carbs in the evening. So I'm going to have like some carbs with potato or rice or something like that. It will be in the evenings. Um, yeah. And it would just be like, I guess, typically animal proteins like eggs, steak, tuna, um, lamb, that kind of thing. Uh, and then, and to be honest, I do have vegetables, but I have far less in my diet at the moment. And a lot of this has also been inspired by um, Dr. Sean Baker, who I had on the podcast a couple of times. And he's very famous at the moment for, I say very famous, very Twitter famous, um, for being a very high level athlete for his age. He's 50 and he's breaking world records. And um, he's a zero carb diet. Um, and he basically has big portions of red meat a couple of times a day. Um, so he, he's kind of inspired me to at least experiment with eating this way and seeing if there are any downsides and, um, yeah, and just, I, I feel good eating that way at the moment and, uh, we'll see how things go, but that's kind of how I'm eating. And I think that that has improved my body composition considerably. I did a, I did a caliper test and I'll take that of a pinch of salt because calipers can be sort of two to 3% out if I'm not mistaken. Um, and my body fat was 8.2%. So this dropped from, I think it was 10.4 before that, uh, measured using a bod pod. And I don't believe I've lost any muscle mass. So I look far more shredded than I ever have. Um, but with, I think, a, a fair amount of muscle, although I'm always interested in increasing that if I can. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so I feel, but I feel like diet has played the main role in that. I think... Um, exercise wise you know i've been really inconsistent until now i've been like sometimes training twice a week sometimes once every two weeks you know it's been all over the place Uh, but i would say i've probably been far more active generally so that means much more in the way i like longer walks and you know whereas when i was working in london i was sitting at a desk most of the time and then coming home and sitting down and stuff like that so yeah i think i think maybe it all kind of accumulates but i'd say the key variable was probably diet and just shifting to that kind of intuitive eating pattern you know yeah no that's cool i try and go for a walk at lunch now oh yeah uh, and i find it makes a difference so it wakes me up especially i get out in the sun otherwise i'm in an air-conditioned office uh, i try and go for a walk in a quite a greeny area i find nature kind of revitalizes me is that um, after you eat is it or yeah yeah, okay. There are there there are studies on on nature and mental health as well, which are quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, but so uh, I got a question for you that I'm sure every one of your audience wants to know, and I'm sure they've the moment they they saw you, they wanted to know this question: Do you take steroids, or have you ever taken steroids? <laughs> never, never. Yeah, well, that I yeah. have. I have. Um... No, I mean, I'd look a lot bigger probably if I did. Although I don't know, I don't even know if they'd have that much of a potent effect on someone like me. Um, don't get me wrong, like I, I remember having a conversation with a, a, a friend of mine in London and um, who's probably just as obsessed as I am. This is Ross. I don't think you've ever met Ross. Um, just as obsessed as I am with uh, gaining muscle. And we were both talking about like, you know, would you ever consider taking steroids? And and he was like, yeah, I've considered it, but like, he's not done it. <laughs> He'll probably listen to this and like kill me. But um, now he, he's definitely not. But it's funny how I think, okay, where I'm going with this is I can really appreciate guys that that make that, that do, that, that, you know, that end up do taking steroids or at least dabbling in that because they're that obsessed with gaining muscle, which is, I guess, kind of a sad, a sad thing um, because they see a lot of guys that are, you know, have a lot more muscle mass and sometimes that's you know the the that that's because of their genetics and uh sometimes it's a genetics and steroids you know so yeah it's um i don't know where i'm going with this but yeah I, i'm just saying i i kind of i used to be far more like oh steroids are awful and like how could you even ever think of the possibility but now i can understand why people do uh experiment with that um but i I still think you know it's foolish and i wouldn't i wouldn't do it now or in the future so yeah i mean i only asked (coughs) asked you that i didn't plan on asking it i just was trying to be a twat (laughs) i know you don't take steroids nor have you ever um but i guess what you just said like because i remember seeing the london real documentary with um what's his face dorian yates dorian yates that's it 
um, Mr. Olympia. And uh, and he basically said there's zero point in taking steroids unless you're trying to be in like the top 10 in the world or top 100 or whatever it was. Uh, so when people do take steroids, then they usually if they're not competing, that is, it's usually just for vanity, for feeling strong. And for me, coming from like a, a mental health background, and when I say mental health, I don't just mean sort of diagnosable DSM type criteria. I mean, like people with low self-esteem, that's poor mental health. It's just not diagnosable, right? Okay. Same as physical health is it varies, right? My physical health is not is not like an elite athlete, but I'm not like in the morgue. It's uh, <laughs> it, everyone has that varying between. Um, <clears throat> and I guess where I'm getting at with this is, do you think like people take steroids? There's a real lack in them, and I might be insulting a lot of your audience or some of them. Um, although I think your audience are very very switched on. That there's a real need, like a, they're trying to feel something. Same with people with alcohol or drugs. I don't believe people have addictive personalities. They're just masking a pain, and they're using various things, whether it's steroids, alcohol, or whatever. They're trying to fill a gap. Um, I don't know. It's just a topic. I don't expect you to have the answer. It's just a topic that fascinates me yeah. because, to me, it makes no sense to take steroids because I once heard someone say. If you value aesthetics, you take steroids. If you value health, you don't. And it's that value system. And to me, for someone who weighs looking good over living a long, healthy life, there's something wrong in their wiring currently because that's real short-term thinking. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I, I think the irony, well, yeah, the irony is that I don't think they make you look good at all. I, I, I... I'm not an expert at spotting when people are on them. Like some people you talk to, they know they can tell based on certain the way people's muscles have developed and the way they look, whether they're on steroids or not. And I'm not an expert, but when I do have that feeling that someone might be on them and I see that type of physique, I'm like, I prefer my own physique. I prefer looking mm. leaner and uh, less bulky. And I, I yeah, I, I think actually, and, and I think actually, you know, women are more attracted to leaner, leaner body types. It's just kind of ironic. Like, you know, we're almost trying to get, I say we as in like, you know, guys that are really invested in trying to get as big as possible. They're almost doing it for showing off and doing it for other guys as opposed to doing it for, I guess, attracting the opposite sex, which is kind of strange. Um, but yeah, I think, um, I think you're right. You know, if you're, if you're a, the only reason really to do them, if there is one is if you're like a you know, professional bodybuilder or fitness model and that is your that is your yeah. thing but there are downsides i mean there are um, small cock maybe yeah um and I, I don't know again i'm not an expert on it rage i, I do well, i don't know about that but i do think there's like potentially issues with the endocrine system um, doesn't it mess with your heart as well i don't know i don't know i don't what? I've watched, I watched, there's a really good documentary called Bigger, Faster, Stronger, um, mm. which is all about these uh, free lads that actually all dabble in steroid use, uh, or at least two of them do. Um, and it's essentially like, it, it, you know, this guy, like he interviews a bunch of experts and doctors and, you know, experts on steroids. And there isn't actually, if I remember rightly, at least in this documentary, a lot of evidence to show a tremendous amount of downside. Um, yet they steroids have been stigmatized so much in the media for, um, I think, causing some people to commit suicide and, yeah. you know, caught co co fucks with your brain chemistry, doesn't it? Yeah, p potentially. I mean, look, I don't, I don't know the answers, but, um, but yeah, I guess going back to the original question, I do think that a man's or a, a young man's drive to take steroids to get bigger muscles is a sign of a lacking of something in terms of their mm. own self-confidence, self-image, self-esteem. Um, maybe it's because they're, it could also be an education issue where let's say they've, they've just don't understand that actually genetics dictate how you're going to look um, and how you're going to respond to exercise. And, you know, the yeah. media doesn't help that because the media makes... Absolutely. Yeah. So the media makes a lot of young men and women think that they can achieve crazy physiques, which actually they can't um, because, you know, 99% of people won't be able to achieve some of the physiques you see in the magazines and stuff like that. Um, and what we should be educating people is on how do they optimize 
their workouts and diet to achieve the best version of themselves. And that still looks great regardless of who you are. Um, it's going to look very different between individuals, but it looks great. And I think that that's that education isn't happening enough. I think it's happening on my podcast. Um, mm. And I'm really pleased about that, but it's not happening enough on a on a sort of broader scale. And it, I think it would prevent a lot of this shit, to be honest with you. Yeah, no, I agree. I think the media is, and in many uh, in many incidences, is is the cause of a lot of this. Now, at, at uni, or well, how long ago was that now? Well over ten years ago, I did a study on on um, how men are portrayed within the media from a from a physical health point of view, and how it leads to sort of male bulimia and anorexia, and then obviously now. Um, is it muscle dysmorphia? Yeah. Uh, um, and then there's it. things obviously like body dysmorphic disorder where you look in the mirror and potentially that could be another driving factor. You look in the mirror and you could be buff and hench and cut, but you look in the mirror and you see someone who's not as buff as you, you want to be. Or in terms of it, you almost, you're warped, your vision. So you look in the mirror and what is a perfectly, perfect specimen of a human, you see someone who is, slightly overweight or someone who does who's has doesn't have much muscle and that is a mental disorder in itself to the far extreme i don't i don't I'm not saying everyone who has it would be a very small percentage of people who take steroids have that but that's kind of the real extreme and then it goes from just oh, i don't feel i'm good looking enough so i need to you know live in the gym and Do you know, I have pound some, steroids i have something to add to that um yeah. which i found really interesting as like a self-observation so like um I, I, I've been, as I was saying just now, you know, since I moved to Galway and, uh, it kind of changed up my diet and training and stuff like that. You know, I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm like, I'm really pleased with my physique at the moment. Like I'm really pleased with how I look. Um, and then I did that body fat. No, that's it. Then I bought a scales and I weighed myself and I've dropped to 10. I've dropped to under 11 stone, which I haven't mm. been that light for a long, long time. And it, it made me feel quite concerned because i was like wow is that body fat have i dropped lean lean uh, body mass like muscle i don't know um and then all of a sudden i started feeling less satisfied with my appearance over the next couple of days now there's no difference in the way i look from you know two day uh, yesterday to two uh, two or three days before before i had that had that uh, discovery or made that discovery i look no different it's just my perspectives changed right just mm. because I'm lighter, I feel like, oh, am I, have I lost muscle mass? Am I skinnier? But it's just bullshit. It's just like, it's just, it is, it's really insidious that kind of like those, those kind of triggers that can change your perspective. And I think we all have to be very vigilant of that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, know, I completely agree. Um, yeah. I mean, yes, there's, there's things like compassion focused therapy where you, you raise the kind of compassionate voice within, you know, we all have that voice, which is like, you're worthless, you're shit. And for some people, it's really fucking strong. And that's like, arguably a huge symptom of clinical depression. And then it's for other people, it's just occasionally, oh, you look a bit overweight today. Da, da. And it's about when you hear that going, actually, now I look fucking unbelievable. Like, yeah, I'm not the best where I want to be, but I'm happy with who I am. And now I put on a slightly bit more weight and I want to get rid of it. But equally, I still look in the mirror and I'm like, you know, I'm somewhat happy with who I am. And I used to be like, nah, what the fuck? I feel, I'd feel ashamed of myself. And that's not healthy for anyone to feel. Um, okay, so. Uh, okay, so. Uh, what I uh, kind of touched on it, but your thoughts on everyone chasing hypertrophy mm -hmm. and what a waste of time it is. Yeah, uh, no, that's fine. Like, I'm happy to kind of elaborate on that. Um I think I've been guilty of this. So like anyone who's been listening to Corporate Warrior from the beginning, I'll always ask the question, right? In every single podcast I've done, practically, I'll ask you how, what is the optimal approach to to gaining muscle mass? Like what what is the best way to do it? What's the best way to eat? All of that. And, um, you know, always kind of dissatisfied, not dissatisfied with what I'm hearing, but like always looking for that kind of magic bullet you know, that kind of panacea and that one thing that will just get me all the gains and turn me yeah. into like, I don't know, someone huge. Um, but, but you know, it's, it is, I do think it is a, wa a waste of time because I think 
it's fine to be passionate about training and exercise and wanting to get the be the best version of you and working towards that and always trying to improve. I think that's a great mindset. I think the the danger comes when people are focused on uh, trying to achieve a body type that isn't possible and then that taking away from every other area of their life and um, so obviously yeah. you've got at the extreme end you've got people taking steroids and stuff like that um but i think even a lot of people listen to my podcast they they think there's something else that there's something they're not doing that could get them you know 30 40 percent more muscle and that's just not what the science and the data is showing us, I, I don't think. It's certainly not what my experience is saying us, uh, showing yeah. me. I mean, for example, Skylar Tanner did a really good, um, fantastic article in this called The Six Year Itch, where he spent a large portion of his, like, you know, youth trying to build big muscles. And he's a, you know, quite ectomorphic guy. He looks great, but he's just not a big, big guy. Um, yeah. And, you know, he, he did a lot of research and spoke to a fair few bodybuilders who, you know, it's basically the deal is like if you've been working out and lifting weights and you're in your early 20s or whatever, so that you've already kind of, you know, grown into an adult um, and you've kind of finished that process uh, and you've been working out for a few years, you're going to have 90% of your gains, you know, like, you know, you're, you're going to have that. <laughs> um, and then from there, it's really, really freaking marginal really incremental so he yeah. talked to all these bodybuilders and literally mate they were like i can't remember the exact numbers but they were putting on like maybe a pound of muscle every couple of years or something <laughs> like it was really and and obviously these guys are i think they're a lot of the time they're like pro bodybuilders so they have a reason to yeah. want to achieve that because that's their career that's their that's their life but for the average joe it's like if you're really obsessed with that and you're sacrificing a lot of your the rest of your life to try and get a pound every whatever it is year or, or however long it is it's just not the return on investment is just so bad like you know mm. get to night get your 90 percent or 95 percent, and always try to improve but don't obsess about it you know and doug doug taught me this a long long time ago you know when i first and it's kind of funny because you come this far and you're like oh now i get what you were saying um and he was he was saying like you know, and he, he says this on his, his videos and i think in his books it's like you know plan your life no your workouts around your life not your life around your workouts because it's just not worth it. Mm. And that's, yeah, that's what I'll say on that. Yeah, I get, yeah, I 100% agree. I get what you're saying. My only kind of caveat to play devil's advocate is like, so Matt, our mutual friend, you know, he's a very good marathon runner. He's doing times sort of 230 something now Crazy. for a marathon. I did a marathon recently, like five hours. I fucking hated it. It was hell on earth. Yeah. <laughs> Funny, mate, you've never run 110K. Um, <laughs> <You> say that. <laughs> uh, anyway, so he, he just loves running, right? And we know there's a good chance that in 10, 20, 30 years, he's probably going to have knee problems, joint problems, because he's running like five times a week. He does two runs in a day sometimes. And yes, it's making him an incredible runner. And, you know, you've told him the potential health risks that he may face in the future, but he's like, yeah, but I just love it. And it's the same. Some people might just be like, but I just love being in the gym. I love being around lots of other semi-naked men, and it's sweaty and steamy and hot, and I love pounding so the iron. about your passions, mate. Yeah. yeah. But they, they, <laughs> so they might say something similar to that, right? Mm. So I guess is that kind of like when people say, you, you question people on their religion, they say, yeah, but I just I just felt God, so I know He's real, and that's the end of the topic because you can't you can't disprove their feeling. Yeah. Is that the same as someone in the gym going, "Yeah, but I just love it." it doesn't matter if it's dangerous. Yeah, um, yeah. I, guess, I don't know if I'm answering that question. The question, but like, I don't I think, know if I ask the question to yeah, be honest. <laughs> well, no, I'll add to that conversation. Yeah. That kind of like um, conversation is that I think, yeah, for sure. If you love training for the sake of training you know, in whatever form that comes in, then great, all the power to you if you love it. But, you know, I guess talking about resistance training specifically, <laughs> especially people that do high intensity training, I don't think they really love it. If they're certainly not, if they're doing it properly. That's um, cool. Yeah, it's very discomforting. And I think, yeah, if you want to do it all the time and you enjoy it, then yeah, go for it. But honestly, I feel like 
most of the people that are doing it regularly or you know especially i guess in the high intensity training space are doing it because they want to get bigger not because they really love the training maybe there's a bit of both yeah, but fair enough but yeah. no, I, I do i celebrate i mean I, I i admire matt it's going back to matt talking about his um you know, his, his, he does a lot of kind of steady state work, um, you know, competes at a very high level in, uh, cross, uh, not cross country marathons and half marathons and stuff like that. And he's a, a tremendous athlete. And I really, yeah. I love his discipline and his determination is, it's really admirable. Um, and you know, fair play is, but there is a, there is a, I guess there is a compromise there, you know, there, that may manifest itself in injuries further down the line, um, depending on, whether he keeps up that volume, because I don't know how much resistance training he's doing these days, but I just kept trying to say to him, you know, supplement with some sort of strength training because it will help your joints and it will, it will, yeah. you know, improve your strength and it, potentially your performance. But yeah, it's, it's, that's my thoughts on that really. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I think, um, to kind of stick up for Matt and anyone else who just loves to exercise every day for a million hours is, is what the philosopher Alan Watts said. He said, uh, uh, a short life lived how you want is better than a long life lived in a miserable way. Um, and I think that's sometimes a nice way to look at it. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's just some truth in that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, uh, yeah, you talked about this. So thoughts on accepting genetic limits. Uh, so we discussed that. Um, okay, so for, your thoughts on losing fat, um, i.e. kind of like the any, any any tips like your environment, keeping junk out of the house and that type of thing. So I have a few thoughts on this. Um, I actually think the diet I'm following now, which I'm not sure how easy that will be for people to do, um, especially if they're surrounded by opportunities to eat um, all sorts of different foods throughout the day it might be difficult but i do think it's very very effective for fat loss it's certainly been my experience um so just to reiterate that's basically very very low carb um high protein moderate fat probably um you know one to two meals a day uh, eating until you're full and then i guess fasting until the next meal so an, so honestly like you know a, a normal meal might be you know, it's going to sound quite extreme to some people. And, and I, and I know people are going to have fears over red meat and cholesterol and all of that, which is a whole nother can of worms, which I don't want to get into because I don't agree with yeah. that, that whole hypothesis and everything. But, um, you know, one of my meals might be like free steaks right now, you know? Um, <laughs> and then I won't eat for like, you know, eight or nine hours. Um, and then I'll have like, you know, lamb and a potato or something like that. So, I think that's worked really well. And I think the reason for that is because it's quite low carbohydrate or very low carbohydrate. So you're not, yeah. you're not, um, secreting more insulin and, um, stopping your body from mobilizing fat stores. Um, the real culprit though, isn't just carbs. It's carbs, it's a combination of carbs and fat, which, you know, if people want to learn more about that, I'll point them to Ted Naiman's insulin, uh, resistance talk, which was fantastic on the subject. Um, and so there's that there's that diet that people can play around with and it's incredibly straightforward and simple to follow and i think that when it comes to fat loss exercise yes it plays a tiny role um you know for example if you're doing resistance training um you're building muscle which increases your overall metabolic rate because muscle burns calories um and yes there is i think there's a process that happens after you do intense exercise called the amplification cascade, which helps mobilize stored body fat. But it is, I, I think, I mean, I'm not, I'm no, like I'd say real expert on this, but I feel like it, it's, it's just a, plays a very small role. And I think that diet plays the biggest role in this sense. Um, I think the diet that probably has the best compliance that I've seen is uh, Tim Ferriss's slow carb diet, which is where you basically eat um, meat, fish, eggs, vegetables, and legumes six days a week. And then you have a cheat day and on the cheat day, you eat whatever you like. Um, and I've personally lost a lot of fat and retained a low body fat percentage, sort of 10, 12% for a long period of time doing that. And I know a lot of people that have too, 
Um, and it just seems to be effective from a compliance rate because the perfect diet isn't very perfect if you can't do it. You know, the good yeah, diet, the good diet absolutely. is better than the perfect if you can comply and adhere to it. Um, and I think a big tip, which you mentioned when you asked the question, was keeping your house junk food free. That's huge because if you have junk food in your house, it will call to you. You know, what? Uh, just, yeah. just today. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Ralph was eating. I had a, had a Mars ice cream yeah. before I got on the podcast. I'm just grateful we don't have a, it's not a video podcast. Otherwise, you know, people would switch off, mate, I think. <laughs> Hang on, I'm a specimen. So, so, for example, I had a meal this morning. Uh, my partner and I, we went to a, um, uh, a restaurant and I had a big kind of like high protein breakfast with sausages and eggs and stuff. Um, and then I got home and I was doing some work and then I had, you know, my, my dark chocolate in the fridge was calling at me. So I snacked on a bit of dark chocolate. But I wasn't hungry, you know, uh, and even that, which is, you know, 85% dark chocolate. So it's like, you know, healthier on the spectrum of, you know, sugary foods. Um, it's it's you know it's still not ideal and um i think yeah if you've got if you've got junk food in your house you know and you stock up on that on yeah. a weekly basis every time you go shopping you're not going to succeed or you because otherwise you're so reliant on self-discipline and willpower to like not eat it that it's just not going to work out long term um like if you do do the slow carb diet and i've wrote a whole blog post about this which i'll link to um when you do your cheat day, eat out. Or if you do eat, if you do buy stuff and bring it into the house, bin it all that night. That's what we used to do. So my partner and I used to do slow up diet. We bin everything that night. Um, mm. Other thoughts on losing fat. I do think there's some utility to like uh, lots of movement. So being yeah. sat down all the time has been shown to reduce metabolic rate uh, and also cause things like uh, posture problems and lower back pain. And I think that if you are moving as much as it is uh convenient i think that you know you can obviously get a bit obsessed with this then i think that's going to help you mobilize fat because i really like doug's notion and he said um you know that i think if you if you're very mobile that your the utility of stored body fat goes down um because the body can see that it's it's somewhat burdensome but but the whole like calories in calories out model you know when it comes to exercise is 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 kind of flawed because you burn very very little calories when you exercise period so yeah so yeah diet is the key thing but um and there's also things like there's some interesting literature around um cold exposure so drinking cold water cold showers uh, walking outside and being uh, cold, so just like wearing very little in the way of clothing, um, will help you increase your, you know, your calories burned. Um, which, yeah, I do think that's actually worth playing around with and experimenting with. Um, so those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, fair enough. Good, good advice. Good practical advice. Um, okay, so we answered the next one uh well how or, uh, feel free if you have any more how to mitigate the negative effects of eating junk food uh yeah i like i like this at the moment this is why, this is why i sent you this as a potential talking point um so i really like ted Naiman's approach to this which is that if you know some of the people i talk to are like or i've interviewed are like i never eat junk food like ever and i really respect those people uh ben greenfield's a good example yeah. you know, he, he is like you know well i actually do see him he pres- gave the best response yeah to he- when you asked about do you, come on ben you must eat like a pizza every now and then <laughs> he did he did and uh if anyone wants to listen to that i won't yeah. spoil it here but yeah he refers to junk food as dog shit so if you want to learn more about that listen to that interview it's very uh very interesting response um but i really admire his approach to to die you know he's he's very uh strict with that type of stuff um but you know and and he he kind of referred to junk food as being like cheap, uh, you know, non tasty food. And like, not sure if I totally agree with that. And and it's interesting because when I spoke to Steve Maxwell and Ted Naiman said the same thing. I love the fact that they just admitted that junk food tastes amazing. It does taste amazing. It tastes great. Yes, it makes you feel like crap afterwards, but whilst you're eating it, it, it tastes delightful. <laughs> I hate to say it because, yeah, sure, healthy food can taste great too, but sugar and stuff like that is really tasty. So, 
Um, so my thoughts. So, so uh, Ted, Ted made me think about this, and he's he he eats junk food, and he even admitted that he eats it somewhat semi regularly, if that's even a word, and can get away with it because uh, he makes sure that he ensures that he's very mindful about it. So if he knows he's going to eat junk food, let's say there's a he's going to a party or he's going out for dinner or something like that, he'll make sure that he fasts. He'll either fast before or do like a high intensity training workout right before. Um, and that can help in, I, I believe in, a, uh, in terms of emptying glycogen stores. So like the sugar in your stored in your, in your body and your muscles, um, and also elevate your metabolism. So it makes you a little bit more, um, it, yeah, it mitigates some of the negative effects of eating junk food. Yeah, you, know, you could argue that maybe the, the the crows will come home to roost at some point in the future due to that kind of, um, I guess, dabbling in eating junk food every now and again. But you know, it's a it's a personal choice. It's I think a very personal thing. You know, it, if you want to be a monk and completely cut all that junk out forever, I'm very very. I admire that hugely, um, but I know there's a lot of people out there that aren't prepared to do that, and I'm yeah. probably not prepared to do that right now either. Um, so yeah, I think um, I think the key to, um, I guess, staying lean and healthy, but being able to indulge in junk food every now and again, if that's what you want to do, then I just think you need to be very mindful of it. Like if you're going to do it. Like be strategic, fast beforehand. Like seriously, if you're gonna, if one night you're like, right, Saturday night I'm gonna go out for dinner and we're gonna eat a load of crap and a ton of ice cream or whatever, fast that entire day. Like fast that entire day and do a strength training workout like an hour before. That I mean, obviously there's nothing's gonna mitigate against some of the the negative effects of eating junk food, like some of the the aging effects of. Um, uh, I think it's glycation end products or something, uh, you know, but I think it will help mitigate some of the negative effects, especially when it comes to things like fat gain. But it's just this kind of mindless eating where you're just like, you know, snacking on crap and not really mindfully thinking about it. Uh, I think that can be very detrimental. Mm. Yeah, cool. Good answers. Um, so I got a question here from me. And we've, we've, you've said some things that could answer this, but uh, what is the biggest lie in exercise or nutrition the, the biggest lie being like the, the or the biggest kind of popular popular belief that is bullshit or likely to be bullshit um i would say the most prevalent one in exercise is um doing more exercise will burn calories and help you lose weight i think that is probably the most commonly um repeated message that is false so mm. you know that type of dogma has led to f- you know, millions of people, you know, running out on the streets and, and jogging every day to try and lose body fat. You see it all the time. You just have to go out your front door probably right now and walk down the road and you'll see people running and they always look in crap shape. They always look, yeah. they always got awful body composition. And, um, it's just, it's just such a, it's, it's actually, you know, you can argue, especially if their diet's not on point and they're not doing any strength training, that it's actually detrimental to their health. You know, they are they are potentially losing muscle um, by running, especially if they're running often, because they're signaling yeah. to the body that that muscle isn't required. So they, they lose muscle, their metabolic rate goes down. I mean, this is all explored in Body by Science, so I'm kind of parroting that a little bit. But um, what really fascinated me is that when you do anything regularly, your uh, your efficiency improves, so your economy for that skill improves, meaning you use less energy whenever you do it. It's the reason why uh, you can play, let's say you play basketball a few times, and then when you've played like on the seventh or eighth week, you're far fitter than the first week. Um, but then if you throw yourself in a swimming pool, you're gassed after one length because yeah. it's a very specific type of fitness. Same with running. So, and, w- and if you've been running for a long time, you become very efficient at it and therefore you use less energy to do it. So you're actually going to burn less calories than you would on the first run, on the 10th run, right? So it's just such a ineffective activity um, and it's that kind of meme of you know running and doing lots of exercise with burn calories which is really detrimental it's just i wish it would just die but unfortunately you've got too many too much media too many 
sports and fitness, I, I put in, you know, quotes, experts who are talking about it and, and advocating it. And it's really, really irresponsible and it's, it fucking annoys me. But yeah, so there's that. As you can tell, I'm quite passionate about that. And then the other thing is probably low fat. So like yeah. there's too much, um, too, yeah, too much, I guess, encouragement from the media and misinterpreted studies that are trying to, and, and obviously a lot of this is kind of funded by the corporations who are selling low fat products. Um, you are trying to push that kind of low fat message. Uh, you know, you'll lose fat if you, you eat low fat. And there is some truth in that because actually the leanest athletes are those that do low fat, low carb, high protein, but you have to have fat. Fat is essential for cell function and for like, it is essential for health. And you know, we yeah. need that It's an essential nutrient. Um, and the, the thing is like the problem with the the fact that the, the problem with the low fat that we're seeing the, the you know the low fat products especially those being served um sold in the shops is they're generally replaced with sugar so they then become yeah. high carb that's the issue so if you're eating low fat that's potentially not a huge problem it's just if you're substituting that for carbohydrate then it becomes a problem and that's why we've got one of the reasons why we've got a massive obesity crisis or epidemic globally um and that mm. is very frustrating. And again, both of these things, they come down to just education and people being overwhelmed with uh, information that is uh, doing a disservice and isn't accurate because it's serving some commercial purpose. Yeah, yeah, sugar's a motherfucker. Um, <laughs> I'd love to see studies on, uh, and I don't think there are any, on the impact uh, of sugar on mental health generally because we know it like if you eat sugar you feel like shit you're a bit more down on yourself or you're a bit more lethargic um but on like the real clinical cases i'd love to somehow figure out how sugar has an impact on that if it does that is uh but how are we ever going to find that because everyone eats sugar and usually the majority eat a large amount of sugar so you could never isolate unless you took people you detox them for six months ran a study with no sugar versus the control group. Um, There's a lot of variables. Um, sadly, sugar's very addictive. And how are you going to wean people off for six months when they don't want to, yeah. unless you give them a large amount of money to partake in the study, which, and, and who's going to fund that? Yeah, no, exactly. the funding is the is the, the issue probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's probably some stuff out there. Although I did see, I haven't looked at the literature, but I did see someone share some literature that tried to disprove that sugar had any addictive effects, which... Yeah, I saw that. It was in, like, some popular magazine or, like, there was a semi-serious magazine. I think I sent it to you or Laura Thomas sent it to me or... And it was, a, it was yeah, literally saying that the, vi the vilification of sugar is wrong or something uh -huh. and how we shouldn't be making sugar out to be the bad guy, which we have been. And you look, you look into, the like, the people behind it and, like, I can't remember if it was either funded the journalists or whatever, but there was like sugar dependent companies behind this article. Yeah. And it was in a serious magazine. I got something to add to this, which is um something I discussed with Sean Baker, which is this isn't live yet actually, or it may be live by the time this is live. In fact it will be, probably. Um and this is really important. I think just as a general rule, uh, to those listening, if you if you I mean my, my audience are, are really switched on, so I know that a lot of you won't be doing this, but just stop reading articles and stop reading crap books that, because they're all interpreting studies in their own way. And they're all, and it's just no point. You might, you're much better off, um, you know, just going straight to literature and reading the study. And actually, you know, I, that you could argue, and Sean was saying this to me, it's like, you know what, you, you some of the studies are so, they're, they're, they've, they're trying to show results and they're, they're very intelligent about it that, they convince you, but still their methods may be um, incorrect. And, and actually, the study might not be as uh, accurate as you think. Um, so that makes you think, well, who the fuck do we trust? Like, how do we get our data? How do we get our information? And I think what you've got to do, I think this is the, not the big one, is you've got to take your health into your own hands. You have to do N equals one. You have to self-experiment, figure out what works for you. And keep doing what works and be subjective and quantitative if you can in terms of how you feel and the effects. 
um you know if you eat you know like like sean's doing he's eating you know two portions of red meat a day or one big portion a day um he's is a lot of his practice are highly controversial and he's experiencing wonderful health as a result and he's an orthopedic surgeon so you know yeah. he's and he's very objective he's not he's not like you know biased in any way um so i think you know you need to test protocols out on yourself and and you'll know whether whether or not you're responding well or healthy because um it will be quite obvious to you It'd be obvious in your mood and how you feel and your level of energy and your strength and yeah. all that kind of stuff your pain lack of pain whatever you know yeah that's interesting i completely agree i think you you always need to kind of test on yourself as long as the thing you're testing on yourself isn't obviously harmful right. um but it's like testing, you know, how much ca- uh, caffeine can I take in a day without it messing with my head and body, et cetera, and energy levels. And like, you know, you do those small tests, you don't have to get a spreadsheet or anything, but over time you start to, you know, th- know thyself like, uh, type of thing. Um, I think it makes a big difference. Uh, okay, so I don't know if this makes sense because I can't remember the backstory of why I wrote this, but basically... <laughs> Following on, I'm going to ask it and see if this makes sense to you. Uh, what's the greatest opportunity for for health and fitness? What do you mean? I don't know, mate. That's why I'm asking. I didn't write the backstory for this. I'll try and figure it out. I'm always going to move on. Uh, <laughs> the greatest opportunity being, I'm talking out my ass here, everyone. Um, or where where is there growth for the health and fitness industry? But growth. Uh, ethical growth let's say growth in the sense of like hit or or something else that you deem to be worthy of people's time how how does that how does that grow so do you mean like uh people that are thinking about starting a a business uh, or you know in the kind of health and fitness or nutrition space like where the opportunity is for for, well no let let me rewind or yeah let me reword it because you know, I deem HIT to be somewhat more ethical in the sense of it saves people time, it prevents um, uh, prevents injury. Uh, in theory, you don't necessarily need a gym membership, uh, so you can save money. Um, you, along with HIT, people who follow HIT often don't believe in a huge high protein diet, so they they don't necessarily advocate buying tubs of protein a month, so you save money there. That to me, if it's true, because I'm not saying it is, is ethical. It's an ethical form of fitness. It's not based on what most gyms are based on of come to us five, six times a week and you'll get hench when there's not much clinical proof of this. Um, so how does that, how does the hit industry boom? How does it, how does it become more mainstream? Because at the minute, it's very niche. And that to me, it seems like a bad thing. Yeah, I, I don't. I wish I knew the answer to that. Um, and I've asked it. I've asked a lot of my um, guests that very question. Um, and kind of their resounding response is, unfortunately, it's just not sexy. You know, it's sexy yeah. to me and to like other participants of it and uh, some of my guests. <laughs> but like, you know, un- until the mass media and the corporations that fund all of the uh, things that are sold within the kind of existing health and fitness market, I just don't see HIT becoming a mainstream thing. I mean, it's funny because it has kind of uh, become popular, but it's not really, it's not HIT like, it's not the traditional high intensity it's training. h-i-i-t yeah but it's like it's even more bastardized than that it's more like it's just taken on loads of different weird forms and people are grabbing it and using it to sell workout programs and personal yeah. training and products and things like that and uh but they're just yeah they're just interpreting it their own way so yeah i think um i think the problem is until someone or something or maybe maybe it will gradually uh you know those that kind of really 
um, unethical health and fitness industry, which I will use to kind of capture all of that I just said, um, until that kind of really dissipates and loses its yeah. power, I just don't see high intensity training taking off. Um, it is fascinating though, because you can see that anyone who's really bright, uh, or very objective in the way they think and has those kind of critical thinking skills gets drawn to stuff like high intensity training. You just tell when you can talk, when you talk to people in that space, there are exceptions, but when you talk to people in this space, it's really cool because when you talk about exercise, you're really, you're really defining your terms when you're talking. So for instance, yeah. if you go into a gym and you talk to your average bro, who's just in there and he's a big lad and whatever, you will, um, you know, they'll talk about things like they know what they're talking about. But if you were to kind of probe, they wouldn't have a clue. Like, you know, like I'm trying to find, think of an example. Like It's all surface level. Yeah, it's like if they say, oh, I'm working my muscle to do this. And it's like, well, well and if I do it this frequently, it gives me better results. It's kind of like, well, if you were really to probe that and go, okay, well, how does that, how does that muscle contract? Like what? what you know, they don't know. They don't know the answers to this. They're kind of just copying some workout on YouTube or something like that. Um, and even if you ask, like, um, I mean, like, you know, a, 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 your average personal trainer, they won't understand the body and the way uh, muscle fibers are activated. And they won't understand the stuff as well as a lot of the, um, uh, as a lot of people that I, I suppose I interview and the, you know, like, um, and I want to kind of, I need to step back a second cause I'm kind of, I think high intensity training is, uh, isn't necessarily like, like I was talking to you earlier, like I've become very married to the high intensity training principles, but really the words we sh- I should be using are, uh, are resistance training because ultimately you know, you don't need to do high intensity training to get great results. You can just do resistance training, which just implies that you're using resistance, be it weights or machines or body weight, in order to fatigue musculature, which is going to then stimulate a bunch of positive uh, responses in the body, like increased muscle mass, improved cardiovascular health, um, you know, better blood pressure, and so on. And I think that it's like it's that it's that kind of evidence-based approach to resistance training that you don't see in your when you talk to your bros they just don't seem to have that have almost the capacity to go there it's like they get they glaze over and it's kind of sad um i've kind of lost my train of thought but i think you kind of get my point (laughs) yeah yeah no i agree um but as i say it baffles me that, that it isn't bigger but there's a lot of things in life that baffle me that that they should be bigger but there's unfortunately sometimes the truth doesn't prevail or not for many decades or centuries um i, have, I mean look i just i just sorry yeah. i'm sorry you're gone no no, no yeah. I, I was just gonna say you know pe- the people the people who listen to this podcast all obviously are into exercise pretty heavily because they're listening to hours of you every week talk to guests right uh i was almost saying like it was a bad thing it's obviously not <laughs> uh and uh so they're heavily into it but they are a real minority and people who go to the gym generally, even if they don't like exercise, they go just because they want to lose a bit of weight or get a bit stronger or whatever. Those people who go to the gym period are the minority or who do exercise, don't even have a gym membership. They just go running or they play sport at the weekend. They're all in the majority of people, even if it's only 60%, sorry, yeah, the majority, even if it's only 60, don't exercise regularly, right? Mm-hmm. And, and for those people, they know, in many cases, that exercise is good for you. It's, it helps your heart. It helps, uh, in theory, it helps your happiness levels. Um, it keeps fat down, etc. And so if you don't like exercise, HIT is perfect for you. Yes, it's hell on earth for the eight minutes that you do it, but you only have to do it once every seven to nine days, let's say. You you know what I mean? It's like to me that's a no brainer. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, no, I I completely agree. And um, it's it's yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's like here's this really really effective exercise protocol that's going to get you everything you want from exercise, everything that you dream of having from exercise. This is this is probably the safest, most effective, and efficient protocol you could you could use. but then obviously there's individual variation in terms of like 
you know, you could argue that some people prefer multiple sets. And that's fine. If yeah. you prefer multiple sets, that's not technically high intensity training for being really dogmatic. Um, but like just just realize that actually a single set to failure is probably going to get you the same results. So yeah, I agree with you. Like it's it's baffled me from the beginning. Like um, why hasn't this taken off? But like I said, it's just you've got you know a very very tiny number of people communicating this message, and they're fighting against a massive mach- media machine that is pushing the opposite. You know. Yeah. Um. And until I don't know. Yeah. Like I mean, maybe I also think that. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to sound really like politically incorrect now, but I do think that some people are just fucking stupid and some people just don't get it. Like you can sit there and explain it to them, like why it's more effective and they just don't get it. They're just stupid. Um, I don't know why that is. I don't know if, you know, maybe they're smarter than me in other areas. I don't know, but like it just baffles me. Like, and I know I know I'm not, I know a number of people, a number of guests I have who have had this experience where they're trying to explain to people, you know, why resistance trading and high intensity training as, as an example is an effective means to get them where they want to get to. And they just don't get it. And they go back to doing like something totally random. And don't get me wrong. If you love doing yoga and stuff like that, which actually can be quite beneficial, then great, do it. But if you're not actually doing mm. it, then that's a problem. You need to figure out something that's going to be sustainable for you. Um, so yeah, that's my uh yeah. That's my no, it is. That, really. It's a fair point. Um okay, so we're moving on to productivity. Yep. Um I'd say exercise is probably the meatiest section of this podcast. Uh okay, so Bill and Eileen uh, want to know uh, who are the people that inspire you and why? So I'm guessing this is a general question not related to podcast guests, but it could be obviously. So who are the people that inspire you and why? And furthermore Oh, no, I'll tell you what, I'll ask the second question in a minute if you answer that one. Uh, I think I'm going to say two people that I mentioned already. Um, Tim Ferriss is a big inspiration of mine. Um, my yeah. friends get annoyed because I talk about him all the time, but I think his, I actually think, and I said this to you once, I think he's one of the wisest men of our time. I honestly believe that. I think his approach to everything in life is absolutely fascinating. And it just seems to resonate with my personality type really, really well. Um, and he's inspired me to, I really, I suppose, pursue my passion and yeah. create the content that I've created today. And, you know, I, if you look at, I mean, you just have to go to his website and compare our websites. You can see that I, I, I try and copy. I have, I obviously I have my own uniqueness to what I do. Um, and my, you know, my blog is somewhat unique, but you can see that I, I take a lot from him. And, yeah. uh, so he's been a big inspiration, uh, for me and uh, his writing, especially. And then I guess, uh, secondly, I would say Dr. Doug McGuff, who is just one of the brightest men I've ever had the privilege of speaking with. Um, you know, he just, I, every time I talk to him, he blows my mind and I have like aha moments, like multiple times. And, I just find him to be one of the most articulate, um, intelligent people in terms of, you know, how he communicates and how he kind of communicates ideas that I've ever had, ever spoken with. Um, and yeah. I hope one day I can, you know, go to the US and actually, actually visit him in person would be, would be amazing. But, you know, his, his, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's like paleo and biochemistry talk or something like that, which was on the 21 convention really was the catalyst. That was the video that uh, inspired me and you, I suppose in indirectly to, to start corporate warrior. Um, and then his book mm. body by science was one of those books where you read pops one every five years like that, where it's like a game changer and it yeah. totally changes the way you look at health and fitness and, or look at a, I should say just a book that made me look at a concept very differently. Um, so yeah, those are the first two that come to mind. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those types of books that just kind of blows your world open. It, it makes you realize that you've been seeing the world all wrong. Uh, and admittedly not to be dogmatic again you know the whole hit movement could be utter bollocks i doubt it but it could be let's face it we have to keep the door open otherwise we're ignorant but it's yeah there's 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 several books i've had in my lifetime where you read them and just like holy fuck i didn't realize the world was this possibility or this way do you think 
if you had to name like um, two or three. Alan Watts's books have always done it for me. So the, the the British philosopher that I mentioned earlier, who spent most of his life in the US, um, in California. I'm actually going to visit where he lived in his like little hippie commune for the last few years of his life. His library's still standing. Um, uh, the book, the one in particular, was called Oh man, what? It was written in 1951, and it was oh, something like the Age of Insecurity. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll get you, you can dig out the title. I'll find it later. Yeah. Like I was ages ago, I read it, but that book really kind of shifted. Fiona Harold's Be Your Own Life Coach. I don't necessarily recommend anyone reads it, uh, but at the time, it, that's what opened the door for me for personal development. Double Your Dating by David D'Angelo or Evan <laughs> Pagan. Both had a profound impact on our lives when we were younger. It really changed the way I looked at um, attracting women. I don't want to say picking up. Um, I agree. I agree. All those, obviously, those books had a big impact on me too. Um, and I should say that I guess when you asked me about summary of my background, I, I, I didn't talk about I guess the progression of, of of stuff in relation to like reading books, but those were the big things that changed my direction. I mean, I met you at uni. Yeah, you know, I read Be Your Own Life Coach, which I've actually I think we both reread since, and we both were like, "What? Like this book's not yeah. that great." But back then, it was just like. No, I've never read anything like it and it made me think I could achieve anything. It gave me this like, uh, like, you know, this, this incredible self-belief, um, which then, yeah. And then, you know, after that I read, <laughs> I'll tell a quick story. I, I worked for a, a small firm recruitment firm for a little while and, uh, I worked for the owner of the firm was a chap by the name of David Pike. Um, and he's in his, uh, sort of, mid early 70s um and you know he he was a very fit guy very healthy looking guy and then one day we're all kind of sitting around in a meeting and he just lifted his body weight up off his chair um you know just held his body weight above his chair on his arms and i'd never seen a man that at that age be able to do that so effortlessly yeah um and then you know one day i was like David, how the hell do you do this stuff? Like, how are you? What, what's your secret? And he just slammed the Spartan Health Regime down on my desk, which was a book by Anthony Bova on um, health and diet and strength training and exercise. And, you know, it, it's quite removed from what I do now in terms of the advice in that book, but it started me on a path. And, um, and obviously, you've got the four hour work week and body by science and. Um, I guess more recently, like the Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande, which is all about creating checklists for repetitive tasks in your life. Like, yeah, these books have had a massive impact. And uh, I need to read more good books, I think. Yeah, I agree. I think I think you need, it could be a book or it could be it, it like an example, like, you know, your manager at the age of 70 plus lifting himself out of his chair. Uh, I, I, think, I think the reason why these things shock us is just like they're, they're extreme examples or, or very alternative examples to what reality is for most people. And, and if they make sense and if they resonate with our hearts, so to speak, and they make sense logically, it kind of blows the doors open. As Jeff Thompson calls it, the, the conscious net. Your conscious net becomes wider. And you realize the world's bigger than it is. Um, yeah, and it's a, and I always like looking for those those. What was the saying? It's like the when cr- you find yourself following the crowd, it's time to look. I was I can't remember the yeah, saying. The, you know what I mean? The uh, it's the Hemingway saying. It's a quote yeah. on my about page. <laughs> That's probably why I saw it the other day. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's yeah, it's something like you know, I don't even know off the top of my head, but it's like when you're you find yourself doing what the rest of the people are doing, what the majority are doing, it's time to do the opposite, or you should probably try and do the opposite, or something along those lines. Um, yeah, I like Eben Pagan calls it the critical counterintuitive. Yeah, uh, which, and he would he would uh, always say how he would try and Eben Pagan's a very successful entrepreneur, but the founder of the W dating movement, which was all about how to pick up women and stuff like that, which was um, which I know people have reservations about, and there's a lot of controversy around that, but it was very helpful, I think, for us when we were younger, um, yeah. and. Yeah, he he would say that he'd always hunt 
for the critical counterintuitive and everything. Um, and I sometimes think I've still so much in my life where there's so many stones left unturned on that, that I don't even know of yet. And that's kind of that's exciting, it. but it's also frustrating because I'm like, well, where is that knowledge? Give it to me. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Like you want to be able to look back in 10 years and, and be like, I knew a lot, but I knew nothing to what I know now. The world is so very different to what it was 10 years ago. Yeah. And as you say, it's exciting. Um, so I got, I found the title of the book for anyone that wants to read it. It's the Alan Watts book from 1951. It's uh, The Wisdom of Insecurity, A Message for an Age of Anxiety. Cool. Uh, it's amazing. Okay, so the next question is from Bill Nylian again. Um, they want to know, what are your thoughts on implementing a checklist? Do you do it? And what is your method? So... Love checklists. Um, mentioned a book by Atul Gawande, Checklist Manifesto, which I do think could be summarized on probably a single blog post um, because it's quite a, a straightforward concept. But essentially, checklists are concepts. And I wrote, I did a podcast on this actually, like a monologue, which I'll point to. Um, but basically, checklists are, uh, you know, for where where in any profession or business, be it you know, airline pilot, surgeon, doctor, um, I don't know even someone who's in marketing for a business, there are things we do that require the same actions to achieve them to perform them successfully every single time. But the problem is, especially if they're complex tasks, it become it can become very easy to be complacent and forget to do certain things on that checklist. And as a result, it can, you know, in a in more trivial sense, uh, cause poorer performance in business, let's say, in terms of the marketing example. But, you know, in a context of maybe an airline pilot, it could be catastrophic. Um, and, yeah. you know, for instance, checklists have been implemented in um, aviation and have had you know tremendous effects in terms of reducing the number of like accidents and stuff like that and the same applies to uh, medicine and surgery yeah. and so obviously i don't i didn't use it with that kind of um ideal in mind i'm using it more to become better and more efficient so what i've done in so where have i implemented so yeah i think they're incredibly beneficial and where i've what i've done is in terms of the podcast i've created checklists for every part of the process so um for when i interview someone i have a prep checklist so it's a bunch of bullet points which list all the things i need to do before i talk to someone so you know that could be look at what ted talks they've done uh you know, oh, I'm trying to think now, uh, email people they might know about good questions, poll all of you guys through social media, like make sure I tick off all of those things to make sure that I'm going to have like the best interview. And then I, I won't elaborate on every single point, but like I have a checklist for the interview itself. I have a checklist for uh, the audio so when i do audio production like the steps i have to follow and then i have a checklist for the marketing and the post and the cool thing about this is in your business once you get to a point where your revenues justify you outsourcing some of these activities that you can focus on your unique ability or your strengths um you can use these checklists as a uh something you can send to that person to make sure that they do it exactly how you did it so it just becomes like a you know, like a set of instructions, which anyone can follow. And that's really cool. And I've found that. So I've done that, you know, I don't currently outsource much, but when I did in the past, when I had, you know, a full-time job of a fairly decent salary, um, I could outsource these things and they would be done exactly to spec because I already had done these very, very thorough checklists. Um, so I guess my method is, I guess, firstly, you need to, do something obviously without a checklist if you're doing something the first time you're not going to have a checklist but then as you do it you construct a checklist and then the important thing is is that that checklist is then refined over time so as i learn about 
for instance, more effective ways to market a podcast episode, I will refine the checklist to make sure I add that action in there. Um, it's the same for like a podcast post. If I feel like there's something I need to add to the blog post that will make it more appealing or effective, then I will make sure that I added a checklist so that I don't forget to do it next time around. Um, so that's, yeah, that's where, but they can also be used in all areas of life. So like checklists can be used for, I have them for traveling. So if I go travel somewhere for two days, I have a checklist of all the things I need because otherwise I'll end up forgetting like a belt or a charger or something like that. So checklists can be really useful then. And it also takes the stress out of you yeah. worrying about, oh God, I don't know if I've got everything. Well, if you have a checklist, that's not going to happen. Um, and there's probably tons of areas I don't yet implement it where it could be useful. So yeah, I do that before I travel actually, because I I can get quite anxious traveling. So like, you know, for like because I'm going to America soon, I'll make a list of like when something comes to my mind, oh, I need to print this off, oh, I need to pack this, and I'll write it on the list. So then you know the two days before when I go to pack, I've got a complete list of everything I need, and it t- every time I write it down, it stops me worrying about it. It's done. It's on paper. Like. Uh, David Allen says and getting things done it's just download it onto something external then it's out of your mind you don't have to worry about it yeah agreed um okay so what's your current structure your current structure of your day for optimal productivity so this is something I'm really passionate about talking about because I'm a nerd but I am always trying to refine this and improve it so I let me just hang on I'm just going to plug my laptop in because it's not plugged in and i'm gonna run out of battery um so currently i i really love uh timeless principles of productivity so i'm a big fan of um peter drucker and the effective executive which basically the 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 key message in that book is effectiveness is far more important than efficiency so it's about picking those tasks or task ideally if you've really done the hard thinking and prioritized your you know whatever is your objective and your mission then that number one task should be the very first thing you do that day after you've obviously done your uh done your uh you know morning routine whatever that is coffee breakfast exercise um but then when you come down to do work uh then i think you it, it, it will pay you dividends to figure out, you know, what is the the the, the main activity that's going to take your business forward or take your, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming business here, but like it could be any objective, like what it depends on what that is. But it's just figuring out what that activity is and making sure that you block out time and literally like airplane mode your phone, get off social media, get off email, just focus on getting that one thing done. And if it's, and I, I believe this and I've seen it uh, in my own, in my own, um, in my past in, in terms of my productivity in my day job and when I was working in London and obviously on this podcast is, um, if you get that one thing done, then it doesn't really matter what else you do for the day. Um, I think conversely, if you have a mat and well, this isn't the same for everyone, but it certainly is for me and a lot of people. If you have a massive list of things to do, then you're not going to get anything done. You're just going to procrastinate because it's overwhelming. Um, and you're just going to like fritter your day away with tons of bullshit. Uh, yeah. So I think so currently how I structure my day. So I don't just do the one thing. Obviously I do do other things, but it kind of goes like this. I kind of have a launch sequence. So I try and, I try and automate my mornings. Um, so currently it's, Wake up, make the bed, which I think is like a psychological psychological win, right? Um, yeah. And then I brew coffee, uh, and then I do a, a five minute journal exercise, which is gratitude followed by prioritization for the day. So I have three kind of goals at the moment, and um, I kind of set my I set my action for each one of those goals. Um, and then I do ten push ups, and that's not really for exercise; that's more for um, priming the body in the words of Tony Robbins, but it just kind of gets you, kind of wakes you up. And it's just something I'm playing around with. In fact, sorry, I'll, it's reverse order. So it's push ups, then five minute journal. And if I'm not doing a five minute journal, I'll alternate that with uh, morning pages. So I'll just do like, you know, journal stream of consciousness, like whatever's on my mind, just journal it, just write it out, do an A5 page. Yeah. Uh, but again, I'll prioritize those top three tasks. Um, and then I, 
sometimes will shower or if I'm not going to have a shower, I will just not shower <laughs> and I'll just get on with my, my, my work. Um, but it depends on what I'm doing. If I'm going out, then I'll obviously shower and stuff like that. Um, I obviously will shower at some point that day, but just not first thing. Um, I'm not a complete skank. So, <laughs> so then, so then once I've done my launch sequence and I do, tr I might have breakfast or I might fast. It depends how hungry I'm feeling, but I do, I do really believe that if you can automate that, that's a great thing because it really helps you in terms of, uh, conserving your decision making power to more important shit during the day. If you're, if you're waking up and going, what do I do today? Or what am I going to have for breakfast? No. What should I do for like, you're going to get so stressed out and you're going to use up so much willpower and it's going to eat into your creativity that day. I, there's, there's some literature to prove this, um, which are, which I'll dig up and, and post on the site. But so that's a big one, automating the launch sequence. And then I will, um, I would have figured out by that point, what my, kind of number one sort of number one or two tasks are for that day that I really want to get done um and I will literally block out three hours of my morning to just nail that um so so like you know but there will be exceptions like today I uh my partner had the morning off work so we both went so rather than do any of that stuff I went straight into town with her and we had a really nice breakfast together um but then when I got home I then had my you know, block of time. And today, and I think it's good to give examples, I use that time to record a Patreon video on my page. Um, and I'm crap at video. So it took me like 80 takes to get it right. But that was my that was my kind of key task for the day. And obviously this podcast as well. Um, so then, so what I kind of try and I guess adhere to is kind of the maker manager schedule, um, which is a really good essay on this, which is do the really creative important stuff first thing kind of like between the hours of 8 a.m and 11 if you can and then after lunch do the admin do the kind of stuff that doesn't require the same amount of brain power so you know for instance i try and I, I batch my email uh which i do every other day um and i have something called an intray which if you're not familiar with that that's getting things done speak and that's basically whenever you have a, an idea or an errand or something comes up in your head that you need to do, you put it on your intro. So my intro is basically a list on Evernote and I will every day, I will look at that list and I will sort it. So I'll have like a workflow, like delete. If it takes less than 10 minutes to do, I just do it or I'll schedule it in my calendar or something like that. Um, so that, that kind of like organizational activity comes in the afternoon after email um, assuming I'm checking email that day and then, and then that's it. And then I, I will obviously, I won't necessarily have like set time to do tasks after that, but then it's more of a, I'm going to use your saying, follow your bliss type of, uh, it's type Joseph of, Campbell's, but it's a Joseph on. Campbell, is it? you know, yeah. type of approach where if I feel like I want to do something, I just do whatever I want to do, you know, in the yeah. evening. Um, it depends on how motivated I'm feeling or I might just totally deload and totally just relax and maybe do some exercise or something. Um, but then I also, so in all of this, I'm always batching activities. So anything that I think, so batching is basically where you, you group a bunch of activities together so that yeah. you have less setup cost um, in doing them. And Tim Ferriss talks about this a lot in the four hour work where you can use as the example of a t-shirt production company, um, which is really interesting read, especially this, this part. Um, but basically to take email as an example, you know, email isn't always a very effective use of your time. Um, fucking fly in my way. Um, so email and, and there's, a, there's, some, there's you know tons of like quotes about this like email is everyone else's gender but your own you know but it yeah. can stop you from doing really great work and creative work yeah. so but but that being said it is essential it's an essential tool for communication and getting things done so it does have to be there um but what I try and do is batch it all in one block so that I'm not like, you know, in and out of email all day, which can be highly yeah. stressful and distracting. Um, it, yeah. And I know that you employ a similar thing in your business. Yeah. And I think that this principle can be applied really well in your lifestyle. So I do it for training. Uh, I do it for, um, I'm trying to think now, uh, just different business activities. I will batch them where, I can to just be more effective. 
and not like I think especially being like I, I'm a I guess a, a full time entrepreneur for the first time uh, and I've only been doing that for about a month or two and I can really see how it's so easy to just fritter your day with, with bullshit to just just get to the end of the day and think fuck I've done nothing productive um and it's it's really getting into these routines that can help avoid that i think and mitigate against that um yeah. so that's kind of how i structure it at the moment i do you know i'll be honest like i found the getting things done approach i told you about this like i found it too focused on trying to be efficient and i think that yeah. can be dangerous because if you're trying to get efficient at checking your social media or i don't know doing something else that i don't think is highly important then you're not going to have the capacity to really nail your number one task you, you know you, you have to be careful that you're not trying to do too much and uh, stuff that is unimportant um and so i'm still kind of you know the whole intro thing you know i'm really guilty of missing that completely so i have it in my diary to empty my intro every day and i have like a half hour slot but quite often i'll miss that and then my intro just my to-do list just builds up and up and up and up and it can be quite stressful because you look at it and like fuck i've got i've got to sort that at some point and that's not good if you're you, what you got to realize is um as so you the listeners is you know you think that checking your email when you're not going to respond to it is a harmless activity but it's not if you check email at friday night and you get a really shitty email coming from your boss or something like that and you don't deal with it, you're going to be thinking about that all weekend and you're not going to respond to it by Monday. So what's the point? You might as well just check and respond on Monday. And, you know, the the kind of common theme here is you really, we really need to value our time better and time is fine. Everything else is, you know, you can make more money. You can, you know, that stuff's limitless, but time isn't. Time is so damn precious and you need to guard your time really vigilantly, I think. So those are my yeah. kind of productivity principles that I've stolen <laughs> from uh, from various people and implemented. And, yeah. and that's, again, like, I'm sure you tested and found out what worked for you. Because, um, like, getting things done, uh, that method may work. For, well, I'm sure it does work for some people because he sold yeah. millions of books. But it doesn't work for everyone. So it's about finding what works for you. Uh, we talked about your morning routine. Um, okay, so we'll go on to personal now. Uh, so Deepak Taylor uh, wants to know what's the most embarrassing thing you have ever worn so I, I got two answers to this one and uh, one would be probably when I was wearing nothing um, which would be uh, when we were at university I uh, I think it was second year in the basketball team because I hadn't really played on the team during the first year I had to do the initiation which is on the on the way back on the away game um, I had to run naked back to the university campus which was very very embarrassing and very funny and I'll never forget hang on a minute you didn't have to you opted did I did yes. I oh, okay well then you know I'm crazy but I opted to uh, just to be part of the the fun uh, because I wasn't a fresher and uh, yeah, just very, very embarrassing running back into the university campus during a normal day when there's, you know, girls everywhere and people watching and, you know, you're you're completely naked. So yeah, very, very funny, but very embarrassing. Uh, in terms of like, I'd say one of the most embarrassing things I ever wore, I went uh, years ago, my mate, uh, Nick, studied at Plymouth University and uh, a lot of us went to go and visit him for his birthday and we all went out dressed as superheroes and I decided to go as a silver surfer and I didn't really I wasn't very good at like self-grooming and stuff like that so I was very hairy and uh, oh. I basically yeah, I basically completely painted my body up silver and I had silver like uh, Under Armour shorts like skin tight shorts and I'd got a cheap boogie board surfboard and wrapped it in tin foil and i went as a silver surfer and uh i just remember like getting you know thankfully getting let into the club practically naked um and being in a club and everyone was dressed in like you know tom was cyclops another friend of mine was like wonder woman and nick was spider-man it was cool but 
at the end of the no i say so a, a bouncer kind of walked up to me during the night and told me to put my t-shirt on and then i just looked like a freak because i had a t-shirt on it's like i was walking around in my pants you know what i mean so i just looked like an absolute idiot it was so embarrassing and i just remember like being in the chippy after the night just in like these boxes and a t-shirt it looked like a right bell end. So, <laughs> so that was probably the most embarrassing that's yeah. probably more embarrassing than naked run to be honest with you yeah i think i think it is mm. um okay so this is a question that i put why you play basketball um why do you like basketball oh good question because i'm good at it although you might disagree <laughs> um i do think there is something to that i think if you pick up a sport and you do well in it it motivates you to want to keep doing it I've certainly found the opposite to be true in like skateboarding and anything I've tried to pick up and do and just not been very good at it. I've just not been that motivated to get better. Um, so there is that. I guess uh, I just, uh, I'm trying to think. I love basketball because I love the um, the skill aspect. I love the, I love how, much there is to the game of basketball and how many different ways there is to beat your opponent um, and how many different like opportunities there are and options and how, you know, you can be a very different basketball player to someone else, but you could be very good in different ways. Um, and I don't know, like I just, it's just like, like I think um, it's a sport that allows me to get into flow, you know, get into the zone and, mm -hmm as you know, and as a lot of people know that there's nothing better when you're just in the zone, when you're, whether you're creating great work or you're playing sport or doing or having sex or whatever it is, you know, being in flow is like the greatest thing. Um, and so basketball gives me that. And I love competing. I'm a very competitive person. I love competing against other people. Um, I love exercise. I love the feeling of using my body and movement. So basketball captures all of that for me. And I'll never mm. stop. I love it. I mean, yeah, I love playing. I'll, uh, and that's another thing. Like, I never want to not be able to play basketball my entire life. So I want my exercise and my diet to promote that. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is either they've surrendered to the fact that they won't play a sport after the age of 50, which is really sad, I think, um, mm. or they work out too much and they're potentially harming their chance of being able to play sport later on in life um you know some people argue that even sports like basketball can be um damaging bad to the, the body knees. bad for the knees and things like that but you know there has to be a trade-off right i want i love basketball I, like going back to what we were saying earlier right if you love something then then do it i mean within reason i think there's far more worse things to love that could be that could have major downsides, you know, um, yeah. like drugs or like, you know, like heroin or some shit. Um, but no, I don't... running head on in front of traffic. Yeah. But no, yeah, I love it as, as, as do you. So that's, yeah. So those are the reasons that come to mind. Yeah. Cool. Um, I put the question in, why did you move to Ireland? But are you happy that we've closed that one off? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I would just say, like yeah. I am at some point going to do some kind of like podcast or blog post on how to move country without fucking it up. Cause I think like I've learned a lot from moving country. Um, and I'll just give some quick tips if that's all right. Yeah. So I do think, uh, you know, in, in, this is in the spirit of productivity and efficiency and stuff like that is if you, if you're moving country, like, <sighs> I'm trying to think about this. Um, Make sure that you the, the the most the biggest the arduous thing. It depends on obviously everyone's got a different position, right? If you've got a house to sell or something like that, then that's that's a lot of admin. But if you're like me and you're renting and you're just moving to another country, then I think being as minimalist as you can really helps. So I was quite fortunate. Or we were quite fortunate. We didn't have a lot of stuff to ship. Um, but shipping was probably the most laborious task, you know, shipping all the stuff over. Um, but it's funny because when we actually finally got here and got our stuff, which we shipped to a friend's place, um, I opened the boxes and realized, you know, 80% of the stuff I don't actually need. And I spent a lot of money, well, a couple hundred quid, sending this stuff over. And in retrospect, I just think, you know, just bin it, bin the stuff, mm. sell it, give it away. 
and I think there's some I love the idea of of minimalism and being like you know not being attached to things and um, really only having as much as you need uh, and I think that can enable you to be very mobile um, and actually bring a lot of bring a lot of happiness so yeah I just I think one tip is just um, if you're thinking about moving country just try and really be uh, honest and um like really just look at your belongings and things and think do i really need all this stuff and don't like don't necessarily have to ship the whole freaking lot which can be a nightmare in terms of actually packing it into a box and making sure it doesn't break i was amazed that my xbox one didn't break um in that all i did is wrapped it in newspaper and bubble wrap um and the shipping companies do not treat your box as well not in my experience the boxes were completely warped um so yeah you're not and ideally you're not going to want to send anything over that's fragile um so yeah that would be my main tip um Oh, geez i'm just trying to think of other things but i can't think right now so i'm probably gonna have to post something later on that yeah, that's all right. Wait for the blog post. Mm. Um, okay, so another question I want to know is, you know, you've now been in a relationship for, what, just over four years? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's your longest relationship, uh-huh. um, longer than anyone I've been in as well. Uh, and I want to know what has been your key learning about relationships? Oh, good question. Um key learning about relationships or if, if, if this helps if you had to speak to the four years younger you just as he was getting in his relationship what advice would you give him um i think this is the first thing that comes to mind so to be congruent with who you are mm. i think a lot of people get into relationships and they they there's this, this is really irritating meme that is still floating about in society and it drives me mental. And it's this whole, like, she's always right. Don't upset the queen. Like, oh, yeah. you know, just shut up and you'll be okay. Like she, you know, it's this whole, happy you know, the, wife, happy life. Yeah. Happy wife. Happy life. That whole thing is just complete bullshit. And I think that that meme is actually really detrimental because Men actually act like that. So lots of people, mm. lots of men in relationships, probably and, and women too, um, they 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 kind of give away their power and they they aren't congruent with themselves and they they repress a lot of their desires and a lot of their feelings and thoughts and emotions because they're trying to keep the other person happy. When um, you know, ironically, that's only going to cause more resentment in your relationship. I think if you repress a lot of that stuff and you aren't just you know, like you aren't just kind of embracing that confrontation when it comes up, when you want to express those things or have those conversations, then you're going to have massive resentment for your partner and it's going to result in, you know, a breakup or a very unhappy long-term relationship. So I think I've the big thing, big learning for me has been um, just trying to be congruent with who I am and trying to always be honest. And I think that I haven't always been that way um, in that I've kind of, I guess, been influenced by the whole keep her happy, don't argue type of approach. Um, But you're doing the other person a disservice if you do not act congruently and be honest and be yourself. Um, Obviously, I'm not saying that you should be a dick. Um, You know, you've got to you've got to think critically about and carefully about what you're saying, but you just need to be. I, yeah, I've said it like four times though, but you just have to be congruent with who you are. And I think that is, is really important. So that's my, my biggest learning. What, well, that's maybe not my biggest learning curve, but certainly the first thing that come to mind for me. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. No, good advice. Um, okay. So where do you hope or where are you taking the corporate warrior podcast and brand? Oh, cool. Um, good question. So I, I'm I'm gonna so the goal is is to it's quite simple really from a podcasting point of view it's to try and do an episode every four or five days I say I say four or five because I'm not confident I could do one every four at the moment um, but it's to get an episode out every four or five days um, that is obviously related to optimizing health business or lifestyle and 
it's trying to consciously improve every single episode. So becoming a better interviewer, producing better content, um, getting on better guests, like just always trying to improve in that respect. I should say better guests. I've got on some of the probably best guests I'll ever have. So I should. You just mean in terms myself. of profile, I guess. Uh, yeah, but but at the same time, like some of my, I like the fact that I do bring on people that have a very low profile because they're very exclusive interviews, and I think my audience sure. enjoy those. Um, you know. How many interviews has Mark Sisson done or Rob Wolf? You know, these are great guys, very intelligent guys, but they, um, you know, they've, they've been interviewed a lot. So it's nice to get on different people. Um, and then I think, so, I'd, so that's kind of like my goal is to have that frequency. Um, and I guess long, long term, it would be to do more in-person stuff. So, you know, for example, I'm looking to at some point uh, fly back to the UK to visit James Steele and James Fisher uh, at Southampton University. And I'm hoping we can maybe do some like in-person stuff, uh, in-person podcasts, or maybe video some workouts, maybe create some more interesting content in that in that respect. Um, at some point, I'd love to go to the US and do like a, another kind of, I guess, road trip where I can do more face-to-face -face stuff and actually meet some of the, my guests um, and maybe do in-person interviews. That would be really awesome. But I'm not, but apart from that, I'm not really planning that far ahead. I think it's working well as it is and it just needs to continue um, in terms of, you know, producing high quality content on a sort of frequent basis. I think that's, that's kind of the goal, the mission, if you will. I haven't thought about it any more than that. <laughs> cool. That's good. Um, so... I don't mean this question in the case of like Corporal Warrior. Um, I guess it's more just a general life question, which is what's been your hardest challenge you've faced in life uh, and how have you got past it, dealt with it or whatever, or grown? Oh, man. Uh, hardest challenge. I, do you know what? I can't think about that right now. Yeah. Fair yeah, enough. I right. If you, don't know something comes stuff. up, let yeah. me know. Yeah. Or maybe you've had an easy life. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Uh, okay. So uh, a few quick fire questions to round oh, I have, off. I have one. I oh, have one. On. Sorry. Uh, now I know the, the challenges my guests have. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind is uh, years ago when I was trying to get a – uh, very, I was trying to get a decent well-paid sales job and I was stuck doing a job that was very low paid uh, in Portsmouth. And I really quite passionately wanted to work in London because London had a lot of opportunity and uh, a lot of women. <laughs> yeah. Lots of opportunity in terms of like, you know, I guess relationships, but also financially. Um, so I, would literally go up to London and it's quite cool. Actually, I managed to negotiate, um, with my employer at the time who were very generous and kind and understanding, um, time off to go and do interviews in London whilst I was working there pretty much full time. And I went to London and I had about 10 interviews and I got knocked back every single time. So every single one of my interviews, I, you know, was told I wasn't good enough, didn't have enough experience, didn't, you know, got beaten by a better candidate, like always got knocked back. And that was really hard for me. But coming off the uh, tail end of uh, Be Your Own Life Coach, I was pretty resilient and, and had the perseverance. Um, and I remember one, you might remember this story. Um, I went to this interview with this publishing company, they were called Wilmington, um, for a sales job. And you know, I went and I did the first round interview. It's like a group interview of 10 people and me and one other guy got asked back and I was feeling really confident. I'd learned a lot. It's the other thing. I've learned a lot from the failure I'd had. So I'd learned so much from the previous like eight or nine interviews that I, I knew how to conduct myself better and I knew I had a good chance of succeeding. And the night before the second interview, I went around Tom's house. He's one of my good friends. And he helped me. He'd, he'd, uh, you know, he was uh, in a job that I wanted. Um, he actually beat me to that job, which is kind of funny. Um, but he, 
he uh he was you know already doing really well in sales and it was a, a, a kind of i guess a good an inspiration in that sense so when i was with him we did like a role play sales type thing where i pretend to sell him something and we, we did a lot of preparation for that interview the following day and uh went to the interview uh absolutely nailed it like did it by the book and just felt like i did a really good job and i remember the interview looking at me going lawrence you know you are you're a great guy and you're going to be very successful, but you're not the guy I'm looking for. And I was like, what? And she was like, yeah, I'm looking for more of like a Rockweiler type sales guy. I think she said something like that. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah, I'm looking for someone more like fierce uh, and you don't really fit that. And I was like, oh man, like really, really, really bummed out. And uh, I left the building and I just burst out into tears because I was so confident and so sure of myself. Um, and then I remember like walking back to the train and just as I stepped foot on the train, I jumped back off again. I'm back onto the platform. I was like, no, I'm not going home. I'm not going home until I get this job. So I started trying back to the office and I started trying to call um, the person who interviewed me, the sales manager, and she wasn't picking up. So I called other people and called like the switchboard and they just kind of, you know, said, oh, she's not available. Like call back later. And then I called my recruitment agent and I said, look, you know, I didn't get that, but they said there might be other roles available in the business. Can you just call ahead like and see if you can book an interview for me whilst I'm in London? Cause you know, I'm traveling like two hours from Portsmouth to get here. So while I'm here, let's, let's do some more. Um, so I waited in a local Weatherspoons, you know, <laughs> uh, which is a, for the Americans listening, that's a, a pub in, um, all pubs all around the, the big, UK. Chain. big, big pub chain. Yeah. Uh, and I waited there for a couple of hours and then I had something to eat. And then I got a call from the recruitment agent just saying, Lawrence, go home, mate. They're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yeah, and then like shortly after that, I had another interview at a IT firm. It wasn't in London, but it was far more high profile and better paid. And, uh, you know, I got the job there and I nailed that interview. And that was, you know, it was because of all of the failure I'd had previously I'd met that challenge head on and I'd conquered it. And, you know, if you, you know, if you fast forward, I was top sales guy at my previous employer and I absolutely smashed my targets and brought in multiple multi-million pound contracts. And I think, I think that, you know, it's just funny how a lot of these people didn't see that in me and I've kind of proved them wrong now, I suppose, but, um, that's not their fault. <laughs> but yeah, it just means that just Bear because loss. if you believe in yourself, if someone's telling you you're shit, um, or or that you you can't do something or whatever, then you just got to keep going at it. I mean, this is a obviously that's a you know bit cliche. I know a lot of people say like that kind of thing, um, and obviously you can be disillusioned if you just have to watch X Factor and look at some of the people singing on there who really can't sing at all. Then maybe. <laughs> they really shouldn't be singing. Um, but I think, you know, when you're really good at something and you know, when yeah. you should be ignoring other people. So. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. You can't always take people's, even experts get it wrong right. all the time. Yeah. No, no one. No, it, uh, the only person who gets it right 100% of the time is God. And I'm not even sure if he exists yet. Like, you know, <laughs> what I mean, so uh, every expert doesn't always tell the They tell the truth, but it doesn't mean it's right. That makes sense. Tell their truth. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes you've got to question and uh, trust your judgment. Okay. So, okay. Some, some quick fire questions here is uh, what's the meaning of life? Oh. Meaning of life. 42. 42. Yeah. Uh, okay. First things that come to mind are um, love your work. Um, do, do, do meaningful work that um, fills you with joy and really is focused on your unique strength, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. um, love your friends and family. <laughs> it sounds so corny. Um, you know, make time for what's important in life and spend your life doing things that you love. Um, and spending time with people that build you up. Um I think that's it. I don't honestly think there's anything more to life than those things. I think, oh, and yeah, I guess be be giving. I'm certainly not, I guess you could argue I am giving in 
in that the corporate work podcast is I, I, I'm providing free content to help people, but I guess maybe to be more directly giving like charity work, things like that. I don't do any of that right now, which yeah, I should, I should do. So those are things that I think are important for meaning in life. I think. Fair enough. Mm. Cool. Uh, what would you tell the 20 year old you? Oh man, don't go to, no, that's after university. I enjoyed university, but I'm not sure if I would have gone in hindsight. Um, I would tell that person, oh man, I would tell them that they don't need, it's funny because you almost don't like, you know, you get those, you get the, you hear people ask, answer this question. They say, I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't be here where I am now. And that's true. I can like, hate that answer. Yeah. It's a cop out. Just answer. answer the question. Yeah. Don't be. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is because obviously that's true. And I, 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 I have no regrets and I'm very happy where I am now. But if, but honestly, if you had to, if I had to take my mindset and talk to that young man, I would say to him, do what you love now right like like do work you love now work on your passions because i know for a fact that i would be far better off right now than i am right now i mean again no regrets but i know i would be uh i'd certainly be very very wealthy i know that um and not that that's the be all and end all but it's just you know (laughs) like daily work compounded over multiple years it's inevitable you're going to be pretty successful if you put in the work um and yeah i just would have started like thinking i guess the other thing i would have said to him is like just don't who cares what anyone else thinks just do what you want to do in all areas of my life so because i was so i was such a sheep like i only went to uni because it was the done thing because my mum wanted me to go um and actually you know my mum was indifferent she just wanted me to do something she just didn't want me to be a slob um but all my friends were going and i wanted to go because they went uh and i think it's just a lot of my pretty much all my decisions when i was that age were just they were just made by other people and not myself so yeah i just say to myself just do what you want to do and realize that you'll be far happier if you do that and just do work that you love um and realize that you are awesome Again, that sounds really cliche and corny, but like I just didn't have the self-belief at that age. You know, I I think if you think you're capable of great things, then that's really important to to achieving great things. So that would have been my advice. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Good. Uh, And what advice do you have for those listening who want to live an amazing life? (laughs) I guess it's along the same lines I've already said, but um, I would just be really clear on what you want out of life. So like what you want to do with your time, like for your career or business, um, you know, how you want to spend your time and then use that to work out, you know, what it is you need in terms of an income to support that and then go away and create value that's going to help you achieve that. Um, I know that sounds kind of fluffy, but like, I do think that's really important set of principles to live by um you know exercise safely do resistance training semi-regularly once or twice a week and eat whole food 80 percent of the time if you i would say 100 percent of the time but i think um most of us out there can't do that completely so i would just say eat healthy as much as possible but eat whole food i think is a good rule and low carb in my opinion Mm -hmm. um spend time with the people you really love and the people that make you feel amazing after you spend time with them, like make time for that shit. That's really important. Like social connections, family, that stuff is really, really important. And I've realized that having moved to Galway in Ireland, I'm pretty lonely right now. So if any of you listening are, uh, are in a, you know, an hour's reach from me, uh, maximum ideally, uh, cause I don't have a car currently, uh, in in Galway or, or near me, then let me know because uh, yeah, I'm up for hanging out and talking about hit and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, so I've realised the importance of social connections, and I'm actually making yeah. I'm making enormous amount of effort right now to meet people. Um, you know, I'm going to basketball pickup sessions. I'm attending entrepreneurial events and networking events. I'm going to a really nerdy session on Sunday 
where I'm going to be playing board games and stuff like that with like other nerds. So I'm like, you know, whatever, I'm just doing it. I'm just finding opportunities and trying to meet people because yeah, it can be really when you're lonely, especially think about it. Like I'm, I moved to a new country. I've got very, well, I've got like Ash has a cousin here. Who's, I guess a friend and that's it. That's all I have. And I don't have a job, so I don't have friends in the job. I've just got my, my little, my laptop and my phone and <laughs> my internet connection. And that's it. So like, and it's not the same doing, it helps doing stuff like this, like you and I talking right now. And obviously I've done a few like FaceTime calls, but ain't the same as being in physical contact or seeing someone physically. It's, no. it's very different. And um, I, I do crave that right now. So it's, it made me really appreciate that, which is cool. You know, that's a, it's a cool thing about getting out of your comfort zone and doing stuff like this, like moving to another country as you you kind of forced to like go, it gives you perspective. You're like, oh shit, actually, okay, that guy used to really annoy me back in England, but now I wish I could just hang out with him. It sounds silly, but like you really like, makes you really appreciate that stuff. So um, yeah, social connection's a big one. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. Uh, that psychologist I mentioned earlier, Stephen Hayes, he, his, his email signature is, uh, love isn't everything, it's the only thing. Yeah. And I love that. And I think social connections is a form of love, Connect, connecting and bonding with fellow human beings or even animals, trees, whatever, is a kind of form of love. Completely. Those read more about Alan Watts will understand that and find out more about that. Um, okay, so billboard question. You've got a billboard in, in Galway. No one's going to see it because no one lives there, but you've got one anyway. <laughs> I'm joking. What... Uh, what do you have on that billboard for everyone in Galway to see? Do what you love. <laughs> I've got a, a picture on my wall in my hallway and it says, do what you love, love what you do. And I just think it's really important. Yeah. I, know it's, I know it's hard for people that I uh, just caveat this. I know like people that are families and mortgages and um, you know, they've got a kind of monthly bills and, uh, income they need to achieve and i understand that it's really difficult to make time to do what you love but your life is wasted if you don't and oh, yeah. if that means that you're again i know people are going to just disagree with this because they put more value in their time outside of their work with their family and, and the job is just yeah. a means to an end but if you're doing a job eight hours a day and let's be let's be honest, like most people in jobs don't enjoy what they do. I think that's fairly yeah. people might think that's controversial. I, but thought, I, I saw think, a stat, it was something like sixty percent. Yeah, and it's you just have to think about it, right? We've created industrialization has created all these jobs because they served a society that is a bit outdated now. And you've got all these jobs people are doing where they're just not really they don't really enjoy them. And you think about it, it's eight hours of your day, that's your finite resource being used doing a job you fucking hate or really don't like that much or that you just put up with when you've got unique abilities everyone's got something and it's like spend time doing that and if you can't do it right away just do it once a week or do it Actually, in the evenings yeah. and then hopefully you can transition over at some point if you can figure out how to make an income from it which is a whole nother conversation but yeah do what you love I think is my message to the world. I don't know whether that would resonate with people if they drove past it, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a good one. And I think another one is even if you can't do what you love or you can't be asked to fucking try and do what you love, it's love what you try and find the love in what you do. Mm. That makes sense. Like, like was it Martin Luther King said, if you're a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper in the world or something like that. And it's like, and that's where mindfulness and things like that comes in. When you get good at that, even a job that you don't really enjoy, if you start to become mindful in it, you start to become more focused and engaged and more likely to get in flow and you're more likely to enjoy your job. Um, I saw a meme on uh, or someone spray painted uh, this, this bus stop and it said, Mondays are all right. It's your job that sucks. <laughs> 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 oh um, man i love that oh just on that what about jocko willink if anyone here is like 
moonlighting, which is a, a way of saying, you know, working on your own. If you're, you're in a job and you're about to work on a business on the side that you're trying to move over to, um, and you're doing that like early hours and it means you have to get up early and you need, you need some motivation. Follow Jocko Willink on Twitter. It's awesome and he's hilarious. And he does these like grayscale, I think is what you call it, videos where he, get, you know, he gets up at like 4.30 every day and takes a picture of his watch to show what time it is. And then he does like some mad workout and then he records like some advice at the end of it. And like one of them was like, Oh, what's that? What's that Monday? Yeah, I mean, was he? Oh God, I've ruined that. I've ruined it now. <laughs> what's I can't that? remember. No, it's like, what's that Monday? You talking to me? I'm faster than you. Like, and he's just all about like, you know, don't let any of that stuff get to you. And he's all about self discipline. And you know, it's just very, it's very a freedom. Yeah, he's very uh, motivational. I love it. So, well, yeah, if he's a Navy SEAL, one he's going to be. Yeah, um, but. Okay, so last question then is how can people support you and the show? Um, just just uh, just share it. Share share the content that you really enjoy. It'd mean a lot to me. Um, just go to fifteen minute corporate warrior dot com forward slash podcast and just copy and paste that link and send it to someone who you think would really benefit. Uh, that would be one of the most helpful things you could do. Um, I guess, secondly, if you've got time, just head on over to iTunes and leave a review that helps uh, promote the podcast and improve the ranking. Um, it takes five seconds. iTunes don't make it incredibly easy. I think you have to have an iTunes account. Uh, mm. uh, but yeah, if you could go over to iTunes and leave a review, uh, that would be really helpful. Yeah. Cool. And uh, what's this Patreon thing you mentioned earlier? <laughs> so I've just started a Patreon page. Uh, that's Patreon. P A T R E O N. So P A T R E O N dot com forward slash corporate warrior. Uh, and that's basically a uh, Patreon as a website that enables followers to support creators. So if you join, if you go on that page, um, there'll be different rewards that you can get for contributing a small amount of money every month to support the podcast and the blog. Um, and the rewards are things like, uh, you get private content, sneak peeks on future content. Um, you'll get access to free eBooks, to um, Skype calls, uh, either group calls or one-on-one, -on -one, depending on the level of contribution you make. So there's some cool rewards there that I think a lot of you guys will enjoy. Um, so if you want to hop over and have, take a look at that and decide to make a contribution, that'd be great. Cool. Great. Well, that, that wraps up my interview. I hope people have, have appreciated getting to know you more as the host of the show, the show they listen to every week, I'm sure. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, no, thank you very much, mate. Like, you have a great interview style, obviously, because you have yes. a very successful podcast as well, OCD Stories. That does all right. Well, the OCD Stories, isn't it? The, mate, the. The OCD Stories. Uh, and yeah, yeah, so for everyone listening, um, thanks for taking the time to listen to this. I think it's been one of the longest podcasts ever. Um, for all of the show notes and links, please go to 15minutecorporatewarrior.com forward slash podcast. Um, and on there, you'll be able to see all uh, 63 episodes or 64 episodes uh, and all of the links and resources therein. So thanks very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts of some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corpwarrior.com, that's C O R P warrior.com, and enter your email address. Then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link. Once you click the link, you will be instantly redirected to a PDF version of the transcripts.